Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you for yet another webinar organized by the Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board of CMA Sri Lanka together with the CPD Committee. So as you are well aware, the topic today is costing in the agricultural sector, which I am sure is very interesting and a timely topic in the Sri Lankan context. So we have three eminent speakers, uh, two professors from the University of Peradeniya speaking about this topic, followed by another discussion or another presentation by Mr. Sitendra from India. After the presentations, we will have a panel discussion in which the uh, speakers will also be there. Plus, we will also be having Mr. Mario joining us as a panelist. So to start the proceedings, let me now officially invite uh, President of CMA Sri Lanka, its founder president, Professor Lakshmanar Watavala. Professor Watavala is a renowned figure, not only in Sri Lanka, but also in the South Asian region when it comes to the accounting fraternity. Uh, Professor Watavala has been a past president of the South Asian Federation of Accountants, a past president of CA Sri Lanka. He is the founder president of AAAT Sri Lanka. He has received national honors Sri Lanka Sikha Money in 2019. Plus, he has received the Lifetime Achievement Award from CMA Sri Lanka. Professor Watavala, may I cordially invite for you to, for you to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruchira, for the introductory comments that you have made. Uh, so let me welcome uh, all our uh, distinguished and uh, eminent uh, speakers and panelists and also our the uh, chairman of the uh, Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board who is here with us, Mr. Mahendra Jayasekara, and uh, all our participants, uh, our members and other participants. So today we have a very, as I told you, a very eminent uh, panel uh, who is here with us. We are very happy uh, that we are having them with us because uh, uh, this uh, we have two eminent uh, senior professors from the uh, University of Peradeniya. So I think uh, a professional body uh, linking with uh, uh, the leading uh, university, especially in the agricultural field, I think is a very, very important occasion for us. Uh, so we have senior professor, well, let me welcome senior professor uh, Buddhi Marambe, uh, who is uh, the Weed Science Department uh, uh, professor and uh, in the agricultural de uh, uh, department. And also we have uh, senior professor Jivika Viraheva, uh, who is uh, in the agricultural economics department. So I think uh, we are having going to have two very good uh, views on the uh, costing area. And uh, we are very happy to have with us a very eminent uh, uh, agricultural cost accountant uh, from uh, India, the Indian cost accountants, uh, Mr. Zitendra Rao, uh, who is based in uh, Hyderabad. And of course, we have our uh, eminent Mr. A. N. Raman, who is the uh, uh, on our advisory council and also the uh, uh, one of our chief uh, cost advisors and cost experts uh, in all related areas and uh, Mr. Mahendra Jayasekara, the uh, chairman of the cost and management accounting standards board. So uh, uh, let me welcome you and of course our uh, moderator Mr. Ujira Pereira and Mr. Mario Dialvis. Uh, because Mario is uh, one who is involved in the uh, processing area, but he's also involved in the agricultural growing. So I'm very happy uh, that he's been able to uh, make it today uh, so that we will have uh, a very good view, uh, both on the agricultural sector as well as on the costing and pricing of products. So uh, today, this is a very important area. The first time that we are doing a seminar on the costing in the agricultural sector. Now, this has become important mainly because uh, of uh, what is happening today. Today, you all know that we are in a very uh, crisis situation and one of the most important things is the cost. Daily, the costs are going up. Our rupee has been depreciated and it's also depreciating. As a result, imported products are going up, the local products are going up, today's prices are uh, not uh, there tomorrow. So it's an instantaneous thing and therefore the costing uh, has been becoming very important. Then the other area is reason why costing is important is because we have been uh, dependent on a lot of subsidies. Uh, subsidies uh, which have been going free to the people. 
especially in the agricultural sector where these subsidies have been going, maybe we'll be getting fertilizer, uh, so many other areas where now as a result of these uh, problems that we are having, we need to look at the cost. So we want to make our nation cost conscious. Today, even, uh, of course, I know that uh, we have two eminent uh, professors from the university, but we are giving free education. No one is talking of the cost of education. No one is talking of the cost incurred. How we are getting that money, these are not being spoken of. But today, as a result of this uh, serious situation, the cost of petrol daily, uh, it is going up. The cost of, uh, that is the cost of fuel is going up. As a result, the bar, transport fares, everything, even the agricultural costs are going up because when the transport cost goes up, then uh, uh, there are serious matters relating to the cost. So that's uh, the very reason that we thought that we should speak on this because everyone has to be uh, updated on what this cost is. Some of them are only taking the money because a lot of the government departments, they are getting the budgetary allocations and spending it. But in addition to the cost, we also need to look at the value, the value that one is creating. So these are two important areas. And uh, we are, the CMA Sri Lanka has set up the cost and management accounting standards board. I'm very happy that the chairman is here and he will be able to speak on that. But this uh, will give uh, the preference and also uh, uh, enable people to know how to calculate the cost. Today, even a pound of bread, uh, the, uh, there is a price. But whether cost records are maintained, how this cost is calculated. Now, Paddy Farmer, I don't know whether he knows uh, really what the cost is. There are the actual costs, there are the hidden costs, there are the subsidized costs. So many uh, varieties that are there, but I'm sure that uh, a lot of work has been done by the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture and that they will be able to tell us about this matter. So let me uh, warmly welcome everyone. And I'm happy because uh, at the time that uh, CMA Sri Lanka was incorporated by an act of parliament, at that time, uh, uh, the Minister of Higher Education, Professor Vishwa Varnapal, uh, he uh, spoke at that debate uh, when we were going to be incorporated. And he said uh, that uh, the professional bodies will be able to cooperate with the universities. And that will help both the universities and the professionals. So today, I think it is a historic occasion because we are having, uh, we have joined up with the uh, 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 Peradini University, which is the leading university in the agricultural sector. And we as the National Management Accounting Body, I think that these ties, uh, which we are starting today, will continue and that we will be able to build the uh, uh, cost and management accounting profession uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, with those uh, introductory remarks, let me uh, thank everyone for their presence and uh, I'm sure that we are, we will be all uh, waiting to listen. There are about 300 uh, registrations, but I do hope that some of them will not have any problems in uh, logging in and that they will all uh, come in and listen to us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for explaining the purpose of today's event and for welcoming the audience. Now, let me welcome the leader of the PAC, the chairman of the Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board, Mr. Mahendra Jarsinkara, who is a chartered accountant by profession, a director at Lanka Tiles, to give his remarks as the chairman of the Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board. Over to you, Mr. Mahendra. Yes, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Professor Lakshman Watavala, the, the president and also the founder president of uh, CMA, uh, the council members of uh, CMA, our distinguished speakers and all uh, participants. Of course, the panelists and also the participants. I'm very happy indeed to speak a few words uh, uh, at the opening of this seminar organized by the Cost and Management Accounting Standard Board of Sri Lanka uh, on, the, on this topic, costing in the agricultural sector. As Professor Watavala mentioned, it's a very timely topic. Now, I should also say that Cost and Management Accounting Standard Board, as you may be perhaps aware, was established in 2016 with a view to promulgating Cost and Management Accounting Standards for Sri Lanka. As you are aware, Sri Lanka has a very well established financial accounting standards in line with the globally accepted accounting standards. But we don't have Cost and Management Accounting Standards. 
So the purpose of the cost and management accounting standard boards is to design and promulgate cost and management accounting standards. Now, in the current context, these cost and management accounting standards are very important. As Professor mentioned, in Sri Lanka, due to mismanagement, actually, according to the IMF itself, Sri Lanka is in a serious crisis. No, uh, economy is in a serious crisis, and in particular, the agricultural sector. Unfortunately, the agricultural sector has got into this crisis due to very poor policy making at the highest level uh, in the government. So that we all know. But then we have a duty to try and revitalize this sector because it is the most important sector in the economy. I think for years, my, in my opinion, this sector was not given due recognition by successive governments. That is why we saw very inconsistent policy framework implemented by successive governments when it came to import tariffs. So import tariff policy was very uh, volatile and inconsistent and that made farming a difficult job in Sri Lanka. And that discouraged farmers or discouraged other people venturing into farming. So I think today, Everybody is realizing the importance of the agriculture uh, in, in Sri Lanka. So today, uh, the, the world is facing a food crisis and Sri Lanka is facing a worse crisis. Now, the most important thing is when we emphasize, when we educate and when we uh, uh, create awareness among the farming community as well as the public about the importance of maintaining cost records, the importance of cost, they will gradually begin to understand the, how important costing is in producing agriculture, not only agricultural produce, but also other products. Now, as accountants, we always believe, or uh, we, 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 we are convinced that whatever that can be measured can be controlled. So the idea is to, to measure all cost elements going into production of a goods, or, uh, goods and services. So that will allow people to understand what is the actual cost of a, uh, a good or a service that the people are buying. Now, especially in the current context, when uh, Sri Lankans are buying a lot of goods and services, especially from the government. Now, we are the subsidies given by the government form a very important part of cost. People will demand to know what exactly the cost of these subsidies, what exactly the cost of these products and services. Because today in a very, uh, uh, I mean, spiraling uh, uh, inflationary condition, the cost of goods and services uh, keep going up. And people, when, cost, when the price keep going up only, people will want to know what is the cost of this product of which the price is, go up, the price is going up so rapidly. So, cost and accounting standard board will endeavor to convince the government as well as the private sector about the importance of keeping proper cost records and also the, about the importance of publishing the real cost of producing whatever the products and services they are producing. And what is important is subsidies. Yes, it is important in an economy. Subsidies should be uh, given in a very targeted manner so that the subsidies will not go waste. And also people should know that they are paying for the they are paying for these subsidies. I think in Sri Lanka, one of the problems we have is people think that the government money is not people's money, but people will begin to understand slowly when the prices go up and the cost of products and cost of the cost of goods and uh, services uh, uh, produced in the country keep going up that it is our money that is forming part of the, 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 the cost of goods and services. And when people realize that, people will also want to know whether the price they are paying for the goods and services include anything in corruption, waste, and inefficiency. So that is the main purpose. People should begin to understand that they will not be ready. They don't need to pay anything for corruption, wastage, or inefficiency uh, in any product. So that is the whole purpose of this agricultural sector costing, I am sure, is a 
is a very challenging exercise and uh, as accountants this is a, a very uh, a new area uh, where we haven't really ventured into we haven't really studied uh, 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 the complications in costing agricultural uh, produce so i think our learned uh, speakers the two professors from the peradini university will be able to shed light on this uh, area and we will be able to uh, have a better understanding as to the the challenges uh, in costing uh, product uh, 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 in in costing uh, in agricultural sector and it will be a very uh, beneficial thing for the public as well because this is a very timely topic and uh, and i hope that we will be able to 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 learn a lot and dig deep into this sector and understand how the agricultural sector in sector is working in sri lanka and what is in store for us and what will be the pricing the professor Uh, in agricultural economics i am sure we'll speak about the economic dimension of uh, agricultural production in sri lanka so i wish this seminar all the best i am sure all participants will benefit will benefit immensely from this uh, webinar thank you very much uh, thank you mr mahendra thank you very much for your comments and also for explaining the policy framework required from a financial perspective for this sector to grow now we are moving into the two presentations these two presentations will be delivered by two professors from the university of peradeniya they'll be talking on costing in the agricultural sector with special emphasis on rice production so as per the agenda i will now move into senior professor buddhi marabe uh, professor marabe yeah you want me to continue uh, richard no, no. now Professor Marabe, let me introduce you, Professor. Professor Marabe obtained his B.Sc. degree in agriculture from the University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, and has done his master's and Ph.D. from the Hiroshima University, Japan. He has more than 36 years of experience as an academic at the Department of Crop Science of Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. His research, uh, research interests include weed science, climate change, and food security. With more than 150 research publications, Professor Marabe. has also won the presidential award and national research council merit award in sri lanka for scientific research so sir it is my pleasure to invite you now for your remarks thank you very much richard and thank you very much professor watavela and and cma standards board for inviting me for this this also a new new experience for us to talk to you about agriculture as an agronomist i've been talking about several aspects about agriculture crop production and so on and when professor watavali invited me to deliver this talk i thought will we need a joint effort to get this thing right so with this permission i invited professor jivika veereva who is a senior professor in agricultural economics to join us so where the presentation done richard i will do the initial part and of course we'll change patterns and professor jivika veereva will will carry the baton from a given point onwards so that we can complete the presentation and a lot of things have been told about about the costing in agriculture how important it is and what the purpose of doing it the intended purposes and so on so i need not go and harp on those things again for the sake of time and let me start on with sh by sharing my slides richard can you see my slides yeah um, yeah fine okay see the presentation mode right now all right so as i told you two of us are from the same faculty but representing two departments so study one department is looking at the production aspects mainly and the other department will look at the overall economics about it so that's how this combination would work in a presentation like this and we thought to the best interest of the time to limit ourselves to rice production is our major staple so we all know how important it is right now in the previous two the previous two speakers also highlighted the important so the, the and the dire state that we are in right now thanks to the uh, uh, worst ever policy making that has been done at least since gaining independence that has affected agriculture very badly but despite all that we have to look for future as uh, professor watavel also quite correctly said in a crisis situation like that and this is this is where our people will be more interested in about the prices that they pay and they will start looking at 
how come the product prices have increased all of a sudden? Is it because of the dollar rate? Is it because of the cost of production gone up from the local scenario? A lot of questions, ifs and buts are there. So my job right now is to let you know some components and some important uh, salient features of the production aspects of agriculture, but I will also introduce the food system approach where costing must be done in the future, starting from now, of course, for the benefit of the decision makers as well. All in all, as an agriculturist and agronomist specifically, I'm sure Professor G. V. K. B. Reva as well, our, job, our, our, our fervent hope is to see the producer get a fair price and also the, the consumer will be fair price and, and, and a reasonable profit for them to go ahead with their livelihood. And for the consumer, of course, we'll have a, we'll have a fair price for them as well for the product that they, that they will procure, depending on the purchasing power of the people that are in Sri Lanka, in, even in a situation like this. So let me move forward gradually. Start on with, as an agronomist, I think I thought of letting you know of the complexity that is involved in rice production in Sri Lanka. A lot of factors come into picture, especially even when you start costing this, there are hidden factors. I'm sure Professor Bireva will elaborate on these things more, but let me show you how complex the situation is in the production line. When I say the product, when I talk of production line, I'm talking about from the time the input supply is there, and the time that the, that the product is harvested. From there onwards, the post harvest aspects, Professor Bireheva will, will take the baton from me and start explaining matter from that point onwards. If you look at the paddy cultivation in Sri Lanka, I'm sure you all know there are two cultivating seasons. One is called Yala and the second one is called Maha season. Maha season is the main cultivating season, which usually starts in September of a given year and ends up in February in the following year. So the production that comes from the Maha season, although it started in the previous year, the production is added to the current year where the harvest was taken. So that's the important point to be kept in mind. Usually we, on records, there are about 850,000 hectares of paddy trees that we can cultivate, but roughly about 800,000 is the one that we cultivate every year due to various reasons. Then the minor rainy season, minor cultivating season is called Yala, which we are in right now, officially starts in March and end up in in August, end up in September of the given year. So it basically it covers a whole 12 month calendar. That, that's, how, that, that's the beauty of it. And rainfall is a key factor with respect to agriculture in Sri Lanka because we do open field cultivation, not like having rain shelters and so on, especially in the case of rice because of the level of production that we require. Mind you, since 2000, since 2008, we have been able to produce rice at levels much more than we can consume. In other words, there have been surplus, except in few years, in 2016 and 2017, we, are, we experienced a very severe drought. Three cultivating seasons failed because two monsoons and two months inter-monsoons failed in several locations continuously. So that's where the problem is. But of course, we were able to bounce back thanks to the technologies that we had. But last Maha was a disaster thanks to the decision. It is not a God-given thing, God-made thing, but it's a man-made disaster that we have experienced right now with respect to agriculture in the country. I do think we have time to discuss on those things. And apart from rainfall, there are different irrigation regimes. Of course, there are irrigated fields, totally irrigated and totally rain fed. Irrigation is usually, we call it a supplementary irrigation because we cannot control rainfall in open field conditions. So irrigation is supplementary, but the water is assured like the Mahavali scheme and so on, the water is assured. We know we don't fix the price of water in the country yet, except for it, it has been, it, it is not, I mean, for example, it's not been taken, extracted out for personal purposes or for commercial purposes. There are the ISA cost involved in certain areas. And then come the crop establishment, having all these things set. In, in paddy, we have different types of crop establishment. We have broadcasting, just broadcast, broadcasting seeds. And of course, there is a transplanted method of establishment where we have our nurseries done. And then the seedlings are transplanted in the field. So the labor cost will be higher in those cases. I will bring you some examples to show how things have changed in these type of uh, costing scenarios. 
We cannot forget the climate. Climate plays a crucial role in the ultimate costing. So every season, we have to do a cost costing and see because so the climate impacts may have created havoc in terms of production while the product cost of production is going high, probably purely based for crop damage as well as low yields. And don't forget, we are working under three climatic zones, seven agroclimatic zones, and 46 agroecological regions, which have very peculiar uh, characteristics in terms of soil, in terms of climate, in terms of land use. So all those things will have to be kept in mind whenever the time of costing process goes on. And, add more, and when you try to add things more, there are 200 soil series in Sri Lanka. That means 200 different types of soil in this small island of 65,610 square kilometers. All these things, affect agriculture, affect production, finally the cost of production, and of course the benefits gained by the farming community as well. Naturally, that price, that high cost of production will be transferred to the consumer or to the government, but government means consumer as well. You're talking about say 1 million paddy farmers, but on the other hand, that's on one hand. On the other hand, including this one million, there are 22 million consumers. We should never forget in this costing and then calculating benefit costs and so on. And add to that, we have different cropping systems, rice-based. Remember, there are two cultivating seasons and there are mid-seasons as well. So whether the cultivation to be done season-wise or to be done, the cost to be calculated annually, that depends on the cropping system and the cropping pattern. And there are rice-based cropping system in the lowlands, rice-based cropping systems in the upland, and upland rice and lowland rice separately as well. So those things that we have to keep in mind. Agriculture inputs play an important role. One of the hot topics nowadays, as you will see, so all those things are components that are extremely important and that changes a lot, sometimes from season to season and within in the season as well. Mind you, we import fertilizer not at the same time, not at a, at a single import with a single import license. Fertilizers are imported for about four times a year and every time the price may have changed. And that's one of the classic examples that we experience in this particular year, where the other fertilizer prices are skyrocketing every time a tender has been forwarded. And Sri Lanka, being a cash ridden nation, we are in trouble, of course, in terms of importing these things as well to support agriculture. Then, of course, we can land preparation, harvesting. I will show you some slides. Yeah, we should not forget, we have been late adopted, adopters of technology, but you see in the recent past, from the beginning of the 21st century, there are a lot of things that are happening. Dramatic changes have taken place in the cultivation practices that we have done. And on top of that, there are new technologies that are coming in, and we see the future of those things. I'm not going to bring in that component into action here, because the examples that I'm showing, that I'm showing you have have not included any new technologies coming up, except for varieties, the mechanization that we have done with different type of machineries and so on. Well, remember, I, as I told you, this is something that we should never forget when we start doing costing. Maize on top left-hand corner, more than 90% of the cultivated extent in Sri Lanka is cultivated to hybrid maize and the seeds of hybrid maize being imported totally. And then on your right-hand side, we have developed our new varieties, new hybrids in Sri Lanka for chili, quite costly moving. I mean, the, the cost of seed alone, for example, for a normal pollen, normal uh, high yielding variety of chili is about say 5,000 to 10,000 10, rupees when you consider per, per, per hectare of cultivation. But these seeds, the hybrid seeds, uh, uh, the prices vary from about 80,000 to 150,000, but no complaints from any farmer even to go and do these purchases because they know that the return to investment is there. Then comes on the bottom uh, left hand corner about the micro irrigation systems and bottom right hand corner about the new technologies like leaf color charts that we use and on the on the center about the nutrients and foliar nutrients and so on that we have started using in agriculture and of course i'm sure you have heard of this different technologies being used we don't use polytunnels or rain shelters or paddy cultivation because of the sheer extent that we require because we want to feed our nation because that's our major staple we should not forget that Okay, with that little introduction, let me start talking to you about two terms first before I really go to costing. Food security is something that I'm sure you have all heard and a lot of people misinterpret food security in different ways. But of course, 
the idea and the concept of food security plays a very important role when we start go ahead doing any costing with respect to the practices and processes or components that are involved in a whole process in agriculture. Well, food security, as defined by uh, World Food Summit in 1996, uh, 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 guided by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It includes several components like availability, access, affordability, quality, nutrition, safety, and more importantly, stability coming up. All those things should come together in terms of assuring food security of a given nation. But nowadays, what we are worried, uh, uh, colleagues, is about the availability, access, and affordability. Of course, quality, nutrition, safety plays an important role. But really, in terms of cost of production right now, about the procurement prices, the, the procurement capacity of consumers, the availability of food, the accessibility, and the affordability have become key important aspects. But going further on food security, nowadays society, the scientists have started seeing everything in the concept of food system. Once again, Food and Agriculture Organization brought up this concept and it's a valuable concept where it actually brings in entire range of factors and their interlinked value adding activities uh, to the tour system. So that makes things easy. If people like you, a professional group like you, when you try to do the costing aspect rather than looking at the food security component separately. So when you look at a food system, it involves the production, aggregation, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal of food products. And not only that, it also brings in parts of broader economic, societal, and natural environment in which they are embedded. So this whole story, the whole picture uh, that, that will that will bringing many, many components uh, uh, into limelight will help the costing process that people are now trying to do. I'm really happy to learn that the yeah, group, professional group, right, you are interested in doing this. Of course, certain calculations have been done at the Department of Agriculture level because we are only looking until about the production aspects. We are from Faculty of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture and Faculties of Agriculture work hand in hand in most of the cases. So this will be a very important exercise for us to join hands in the future to make sure this happens and that will give a really good policy direction to the government of Sri Lanka as well to make evidence-based policy making with respect to production aspects as well as value addition thereafter that will fix prices for the consumer to have easy access to those things at an affordable price. So going further, if you take look at the food system, I can I can show it in a circular manner like what I showed in, 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 in the right hand side, but on the left hand side, like on a straight line up and down to understand that it's a circle, it's a circulating system. But the important part is if you take the nutrient management of paddy crop as the key, we get all the other components into it. We have the farm inputs, the production aspects, transportation and storage, processing, distribution, in use, post use. That includes the wastage. That includes the, the the things that you that you fill the your your your, your waste basket baskets at, at home. When I say you, it's you and me, right? The, the the things that moves out of your plate, food plate, and all those things will have to be considered in a food system. And that's how the costing becomes easier when you try to look at the overall thing, overall overall food production and value addition segment as a food system because the components that are required to be considered in calculating the cost will come into picture. To give you some examples, if I take the same conceptual framework that I have shown you in the, in the left hand side, looking at the nutrient management component and to see what what uh, 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 subdivisions or subcomponents come into picture in achieving nutrient management in a crop. So that means that helps in calculations. As I told you, it's a complex system once again, because when you look at nutrient management, you have to consider the soil conditions, temperature and precipitation in a biological system. But moving further on economic system, which I'm sure which, uh, uh, which draw your interest, we have to look at the irrigation, seeds, fertilizer, equipment, labor, capital, involvement, infrastructure, facility, other facilities, whatever the terminals with respect to storage that we have. We have to look at wholesalers, grocers, the retailers, restaurants, individuals, whole gamut of players will come into picture to, to help us in identifying the price structures at each different significant nodal points and to see how it moves further until it reaches the consumer. And there are in 
there's an interesting study that is done in Sri Lanka right now. I will highlight that in a while where Professor Chivika Reva will harp on it in her presentation as well. And of course, these political things come up naturally to, to govern, to regulate all these things that I was talking to. Subsidies were discussed heavily uh, by even Professor Watavala. And now, of course, we are not people who are who are, who are for subsidies. There may be categories of people which you do understand sometimes in a crisis situation like this, there has to be some sort of support, but we know unfortunately the subsidies that are given with respect to fertilizer in Sri Lanka, nobody asks for it, but the politicians want to give it as election pledges, very unfortunately. And taxes, there are a lot of discussions going on right now in those things. And while looking at all these aspects, of course, we have to bring in the risk factors, of course, in our calculations as well. So. A lot of uncertainties that are there, a lot of complexities are there and in, 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 in costing the agricultural uh, uh, system. And that is the important thing that we all have to keep in mind. It's not a straight line, but we have to go back and forth, look at all different hidden aspects and so on. And if you look at even the rice production, if you try to do a costing in the case of rice production, at least up to the production levels from the time the input supply is done, we have to consider these aspects. There are new high yielding varieties that are coming up. So if the variety changes to a traditional variety, the whole costing structure differs. That's an important thing to be kept in mind. And if you know, as I told you at the beginning, Sri Lanka, well, Sri Lankans were late adopters. Two-wheel tractors came to Sri Lanka, was introduced in early 1950s. The, the, the four-wheel tractors, I'm sorry, the two-wheel tractors came later, but still it took such a long period of time for Sri Lankans to... Uh, Sri Lankans to adopt these things because there were a lot of other social issues that were coming up. But finally, we have succeeded. So if you take rice and maize, initial stage or the head end, and the tail end at the time of harvesting, for example, have been mechanized. As you see here, we started like this. This is how agricultural operations started earlier and we have moved forward very well even now it will be very difficult to find a paddy field that even not use a two-wheel tractor to do land preparation and when it comes to harvesting we start with this back breaking back breaking techniques i'm sorry back breaking techniques and then move forward with using oxen and then of course we started using machineries like this and you know about, you have heard about tsunami and so on, right? So, so these, these are the processing technologies that we had and now we have combined harvesters. At the end, even starting from huge combined harvesters used in uh, the Eastern provinces and so on, and the small made miniaturized combined harvesters used in smaller paddy fields in the Western provinces as well. So technologies have come up, price structures have changed. With that, now I'm going to two examples that I'm going to present to you. Remember, I was talking about different contexts with respect to paddy production in Sri Lanka. There are different climatic zones in this country, different crop pattern establishment techniques, and different irrigation practices as well. When I tell rain fed, when I say rain fed, that is purely rain fed, then there's no supplementary irrigation. That is, they are in minor irrigation schemes in the in this country. They are the irrigation tank capacity is very, very small, and sometimes it does not have an adequate storage to be to irrigate the full paddy crop. So that's why we call it rain fed in majority of the cases. If you look at the costing that has been done by the Department of Agriculture, this is not my creation. This, this is of, of course available at the Department of Agriculture to a great detail, I must tell you, and in a rain-fed and transplanted. Usually when the rain-fed uh, conditions are there, people go and do transplanting in, in those areas, but transplanting is generally done at very low extents in this country. Keep that in mind also. And once the transplanting takes place, the labor cost goes up rapidly. And there's a problem, as you know, with, with the adequate availability of labor, timely availability of labor, and the cost of labor, which is enormous compared to Indian scenario uh, uh, at this particular time. But if you convert it into dollars right now, we may be in a better position, I must tell you. So this is how things have worked in the, in, in, in the country. I have, I have divided this into two segments. Initial part is for land preparation overall, and the next part is for the, from the cost that is involved in from the time the crop is established, established in the field. So this is how it goes. This type of cost calculations are there. 
and you can see the cost compost, the labor cost is more in transplanting naturally because of more labor involved in this, in this particular situation. If you look at a different scenario, that's irrigated and broadcast of rice, the, the, the components that comes from labor, machinery and material costs are different because there's mainly low labor involvement, involvement in broadcasting where one or two people can easily broadcast the rice paddies into the paddy field. Though these calculations are there, we can have the discussions, but I can definitely pass this information to you all to have a more in-depth view so that we can discuss later in detail to see how this costing process should go on. Now, there have been exercises done in the past. This is my last slide where I'm going to pass on the baton to Professor Vireheva. A lot of exercises have been done in the past to see how production can be done effectively, especially in a cost-effective manner. But the important part right now, we said there is a project going on in Sri Lanka, looking at seven commodities, including paddy, including rice, to see how the food flow take place across the country in all districts. This is funded by the Food and Agricultural Organization, a research project, which is done with uh, done uh, in collaboration with the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya. I work as, I serve as a project leader. Professor Virewa is also a leading scientist in this project, which involves seven faculties of agriculture as well, bringing a lot of people into it and try to get this food flow done to see how from the time the, uh, the agricultural produce agricultural products come from the farm gate and how it's move until it reaches the consumer especially looking at how the how the how the rural urban connectivity is done that is one of the key components the key studies that we do right now to identify key nodal points and that will help you all as well in terms of cost calculations in later the cost calculations to be done later this come as a request from the ministry of agriculture as i told you seven commodities we look at 75 districts nine provinces and we sincerely hope that we'll set the base for understanding changes in price in the future, food miles and most appropriate food flow models and so on, that will definitely affect the, the costing aspect as well as the, 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 the final consumer product and the final consumer price. So that's the overall idea. And with that little uh, introduction and short presentation, let me now hand over the uh, uh, forum to Professor Jivika Virehba. Over to you, Jivika. Uh, Professor Jivika, before you commence, uh, yes. let me make a small introduction about you. Uh, yes, Professor sir. Jivika? Yes, I'm here. You can hear me, right? Yeah, before, you, me. before you come, in, madam, let me please. Uh, uh, Professor, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Professor of Agricultural Economics attached to the department. Department of Agricultural Economics and Business Management of University of Peradeniya. She serves as an honorary fellow at the Faculty of Veterinary, as a chair of Sri Lanka Forum, University of Economics in 2021, a collaborator of the International Food Policy Research Institute, a Hewlett Fellow of the International Agricultural Trade Research Consortium, a Fellow of the Canadian Agricultural Trade Policy Research Network, and a recipient of an Endeavour Fellowship awarded by the Government of Australia. So, Professor Jeevika, you would like to hear your comments or as Professor, uh, uh, as pro the previous professor has mentioned, you would like to see the continuation of the presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Professor. Of course, uh, it's a continuation of uh, what uh, Professor Marambe presented. Uh, as Professor Marambe presented, uh, we actually do have information uh, up to farm gate uh, with respect to cost of production of uh, quite a number of uh, agricultural commodities, not only paddy, but we do have information uh, on other field crops. And uh, also we have uh, information on uh, certain uh, floricultural uh, crops as well, as well as uh, uh, fruit crops. But uh, I should say that uh, the Department of Agriculture is uh, doing a wonderful job uh, in releasing uh, cost of cultivation of uh, annual crops uh, every uh, six months uh, for Yala and Maha season. And we do have information uh, of uh, the breakdown that uh, you really would like to have. But uh, uh, finding out information uh, beyond the farm gate, uh, of course, is possible, but I would say that uh, it is a challenging task. So if I may uh, 
reiterate the, what the Professor Marambe said. The, this is a long chain, uh, you know, starting from uh, nutrient uh, management uh, up until uh, consumption uh, by people like uh, you and me. So if we are to do a costing, we will have to pay attention, uh, not only up to production, but uh, the other uh, activities uh, uh, that uh, the other players uh, in the value chain play, like transportation, storage, uh, processing, uh, that is uh, like uh, milling of uh, paddy when it comes to uh, rice, uh, and also packaging, labeling, uh, and uh, distribution uh, at wholesale level and uh, retail level. So these are the activities happening after the farm gate. So when we designed our food flow uh, mapping project, uh, we paid attention to all these. So we actually uh, thought that, uh, okay, this is a straightforward uh, exercise. Uh, uh, collectors will collect uh, the produce uh, from the farmers and then uh, they give it to uh, the processors. Uh, processors pass it to, to wholesalers and then to retailers. And uh, finally, we all consume. So we thought that, uh, okay, uh, we can do this. This is a pretty uh, straightforward exercise. However, when we uh, try to operationalize this, uh, we really felt uh, uh, the challenge. Of course, uh, when you say millers, uh, so you uh, must be thinking, you know, all these large millers, but uh, uh, there are so many uh, small uh, and medium uh, enterprises uh, which are engaged uh, in uh, milling uh, paddy actually not only milling paddy, but uh, all kinds of uh, food processing activities. And uh, we have uh, to uh, uh, consider costs uh, incurred in uh, transportation, uh, storage, uh, and uh, there are large uh, storages like Matala uh, International Airport as well as uh, fine uh, small uh, storages uh, in uh, uh, farmhouses. And, uh, Retailing is done by large supermarkets as well as uh, street vendors. And uh, on top of that, uh, we import uh, items. Uh, and uh, that is another channel that we have to consider. When we look at uh, uh, the actors and the activities uh, beyond farm gate. So uh, we actually uh, looked at uh, what other countries have done. Uh, with respect to uh, these activities uh, to get a sense of uh, what kind of uh, methodologies that uh, one can add up uh, in uh, measuring these costs. And what we found uh, was that uh, this has been a challenging exercise for many researchers, even outside of Sri Lanka. Actually, uh, we have sufficient data, not only on production, but also on consumption. If you look at uh, our uh, Department of uh, Census and uh, Statistics uh, Service, uh, we have uh, information related to food consumption uh, at uh, every uh, four years or five years. The latest uh, available is for 2019. However, we do not have uh, sufficient information on the middle segment uh, of the food flow. So uh, the, these uh, Agents include uh, traders, truckers, uh, processors, uh, you know, uh, uh, small uh, boutique owners, uh, small uh, millers. So we actually do not have sufficient uh, information. And uh, when you look at uh, the agriculture sectors of uh, developing countries, you see that uh, this sector is pretty uh, informal and uh, they contribute uh, around 40% to the gross uh, value of the value chains uh, in many developing countries for many products. So uh, uh, products like uh, rice, it can be uh, small, but uh, for many perishables, uh, this constitute uh, a large uh, margin, okay? And uh, also uh, in many developing countries, uh, around uh, 80% of the midstream uh, of the value chain comprises of uh, small and medium enterprises. So people uh, in this uh, uh, research field uh, tend to call this uh, hidden middle, meaning that uh, uh, the information on this middle sector is hidden. It doesn't mean that uh, it is missing, 
it is uh, hidden. Okay, and the researchers uh, have not paid sufficient attention to get the information uh, from these uh, uh, actors. And uh, sorry, something is happening, and my slides are not moving. I will end the show and uh, try again. Now oh, it's moving, yeah. It's moving, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, suppose that somehow uh, we gather information about uh, the actors in the middle chain. Then if you are to do a costing, then we will have to pay attention to cost incurred uh, uh, at every activity. So some of these uh, costs are explicit. Uh, it's very easy to uh, identify. These are the direct outlays, the amounts uh, that uh, you pay for fertilizers, pesticides, seeds, uh, uh, packaging materials, uh, all these. But there are implicit costs as well, uh, because uh, you see that uh, most of these players are in the uh, informal market and they are rather small. So most of the time you see that uh, the owners are the managers. So their managerial skills are not uh, accounted uh, if you only look at uh, explicit costs. So ideally, you should uh, pay attention to explicit costs as well as implicit costs. And uh, implicit costs, uh, of course, uh, is challenging because uh, there is no market for this. So you cannot uh, record market prices as implicit costs. So you have to have uh, uh, ways and means of uh, finding out uh, how large or small are these implicit costs. And uh, when it comes to explicit cost, one can do this uh, uh, costing using market prices uh, as well as opportunity cost of resources. Of course, uh, getting market prices is uh, straightforward. Let's say that uh, you want to find out the cost of fertilizer then uh, you look at uh, the prices prevail in the market, the, the amounts paid by the uh, farmer. However, the right price is not the market price. You have to adjust these market uh, prices by the subsidies and uh, taxes uh, charged uh, by the government. So ideally, when we do economic analysis, uh, we pay attention to both explicit costs and implicit costs and within explicit costs, uh, we pay attention to opportunity costs. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, getting information on one hand uh, is challenging, given the nature of the structure of this uh, industry, and also finding out exact costs and getting uh, their opportunity costs is challenging because uh, agriculture sector and uh, uh, the food sector are highly regulated uh, uh, by the government. So either there are subsidies or there are missing markets. Uh, and uh, we, we really have to pay attention to all these things. And on top of that, uh, there are claims that uh, most of these uh, market agents exercise uh, market power, particularly those uh, who are large enough to influence market prices uh, do exercise that power. So most of these uh, margins uh, include the uh, market power as well. So I uh, heard uh, one of the uh, uh, gentlemen uh, indicated that uh, we are not willing to pay for uh, corruption or wastage or inefficiency. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there are lots of uh, inefficiencies in agricultural and uh, food value chains. Uh, so you have to account uh, for those. Yeah, so um, in our study, uh, when we try to uh, understand the uh, food flows, uh, another complication came up. So we, we initially uh, thought that uh, these uh, chains are linear, but uh, when we uh, collected data, we realized that uh, there are different types of uh, market segments. Uh, there, are, there are segments where farmer is uh, skipping uh, the collector and uh, supplying the product. 
directly to a processor and uh, the processor uh, sells it uh, directly uh, to the retailer bypassing the wholesaler so there are instances of that sort okay and sometimes uh, a farmer uh, uh, sells it to the collector and collector sells it to the miller so it, it goes through the usual uh, chain so there are various types of uh, segments so in uh, our study what we try to do is uh, uh, to uh, compare and contrast uh, different uh, segments uh, to see which segments are more cost effective uh, and which are not and uh, we also uh, noted that uh, even the same agent uh, engages in uh, in uh, uh, multiple activities like uh, this, we can see that uh, certain agents uh, transport the product and store it uh, until uh, he or she uh, gets a good market okay and certain uh, uh, collectors engage in sorting uh, and packaging of the product before it is uh, sold to the next agent so uh, getting information uh, uh, on costing requires a very good understanding of uh, what the structure of this sector is and that is what uh, we try to do this study but that uh, study is not about costing it's about uh, giving a description uh, on uh, the food flows uh, for seven commodities in sri lanka however a previous study uh, done by uh, senanayaka and uh, one uh, premarath dr premarath i think uh, in 2016 uh, uh, gave us uh, a good uh, description of uh, the uh, the chains uh, and you can see this uh, flow chart uh, and also uh, some estimates uh, on uh, the margins at uh, different places okay so these numbers are pretty small uh, because uh, they estimated these uh, costs uh, in uh, 2012 so that was like uh, 10 years back but we can inflate and get a sense of uh, Uh, costing along the value chain uh, for a certain segment uh, in Sri Lanka. So this is uh, from uh, Hambantota uh, to Purunegala, if I can remember. So you you uh, actually uh, uh, do not see this kind of cost estimates uh, for the uh, entire country. So here and there you can see this kind of studies uh, showing uh, the costs. Uh, Uh, of uh, different uh, market segments so uh, one of the biggest challenges that uh, we face is uh, uh, unavailability of data of course uh, the annual survey of industries uh, uh, done by uh, the department of uh, census and statistics uh, provide some information on uh, food processing but uh, that uh, uh, information is uh, pretty much aggregated so we need the disaggregated data and i think uh, they have the raw data and if they can uh, provide uh, us at least some information related to different sub sectors of uh, food industry it will help and uh, researchers uh, like us uh, find it very difficult to uh, draw representative samples because we really do not uh, find the sampling trends uh, we do not know what the population is what the population of truckers are what the population of uh, people uh, who are storing uh, uh, food items so it's very difficult to uh, do uh, uh, studies with representative samples so we can do some case studies and find out uh, what the cost structures are but uh, getting uh, uh, island wide uh, Uh, representative samples is uh, uh, pretty much uh, challenging and uh, also uh, breaking down these marketing margins into market uh, power versus fair margins uh, is a challenging task because uh, most of these uh, large uh, agents uh, do not reveal uh, information related to their cost of uh, processing or cost of production so it's very difficult to uh, identify market power and uh, also uh, perishability of uh, this produce uh, at the uh, more uh, challenges uh, to this uh, exercise 
So uh, at the end, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, if uh, government agencies like uh, the Department of Census and Statistics uh, provide uh, regular updates, uh, at least on uh, items like transportation costs, uh, because uh, in other countries I have seen that uh, truck surveys are done uh, regularly, uh, and uh, we, if uh, such information is available, it is possible. Uh, is possible to uh, uh, get some proxies at least. And uh, also, uh, we need to incentivize, incentivize uh, researchers uh, to conduct the research uh, on the hidden middle, uh, which is lacking in uh, not only in Sri Lanka, in uh, many other countries. And uh, we need to regularly monitor structure, conduct, and uh, performance of food industries. And another challenge we face is that uh, the sector is uh, very informal. And if uh, the government uh, can take steps uh, to register these uh, 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 actors, uh, then uh, that, that will uh, help us to implement uh, further uh, policies uh, to regulate this industry. So as the first step, uh, some kind of business registration uh, is, uh, is needed because uh, our economy is uh, very informal so it is very difficult to track uh, what is happening. Yeah, with that, uh, I conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Jivika, and also Professor Marabe for deliberating the cost calculation in the agricultural sector, explaining the cost components and the challenges, especially focusing on the rice production. So now I, now I move into another presentation. This time, uh, this presentation will be delivered by Mr. Detukti uh, Sitendra Rao. He's from India. He is a practicing cost and management accountant, focusing especially on the uh, cost calculation for the agricultural sector. Mr. Rao, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nishira. And then let me now just share this screen. Still, I can't see. Are you able to see now? No. Yeah. Well, uh, at the outset, uh, Namaskar, and uh, thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity that is given to me. Uh, now I think you'll be able to see the screen just getting loaded. Meanwhile, uh, let me compliment my uh, co-speakers, uh, Professor Marambe and Professor Jivika, for having thrown excellent light on the existing practices that are going on in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, which has enlightened me as far as the practices of agricultural casting matters in Sri Lanka. I found that they are in a way similar to what is happening in my country, in India as well. Uh, the approach, my approach would be uh, like this. Sir. My approach is completely, uh, would be driven towards the cost management perspective where the role of CMA would be highlighted. Uh, I will be very happy if this can get Share. I don't know why it is shared. Are you able to see, sir, now? No, now it went off. Oh, now. Yeah. Now, now, okay. Now, now, now it's okay. coming? Okay, okay. Yeah. You can okay. go to presentation. Yeah, presentation mode. This is another problem with the animation transition. I think it is down, no? Presentation one down, down. I think I need to go out. Yes, ten minutes. No, it is down, down. No, no, down, down, down. Right down. Uh. No, no, on, uh, no, no, no. Below, Strange below, below, uh, below, below oh, screen. I, yeah. Below. No, no, I got it. Uh. No, I got it. So essentially, my driving would be uh, starting with the uh, 
the concerns and uh, 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 and the concerns of the farmers and then talk something about the costing system that is prevailing uh, as per my understanding in india and uh, i made a attempt to, cor to, to correlate the same thing to that of even the sri lanka condition after all, we are all in the same subcontinent then i would quickly move to the cma profession which has lot of responsibility lot of uh, you know lot of uh, uh, you know accountability a lot of lot of role to play with reference to safeguarding the precious species called the the farmer so this is the one, one topic now when i come to the objective see we as a cost and management accountants do believe that we are going to develop certain tools that is going to control the management in all fields of economic activity we never confined ourselves to the say a manufacturing a service kind of a thing we were always talking about the entire sphere of the economic activity and we know substantial of the population particularly in this subcontinent sri lanka and india they are all of rural area and predominantly it is occupied with agriculture in india nearly 60% of the population go with agriculture as their main activity now friends capacity building of farming community should never be ignored this is one fact i wanted to highlight throughout my presentation in the sense one fine day if there is no farmer you and me will not have energy to speak at all so therefore capacity building is the focus area of the of the government any government for that matter then we all know there is a concept called dharma dharma implies sarve jana sukhino bhavantu which implies a farmer as well i mean my talk appears to be as if i am going slightly you know uh, going i mean going towards the favor of the farmer but that is at times appear to the ground reality when you look at the the uh, the, the 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 economic situation of the farmer that is prevailing now friends we know entrepreneur i borrowed this particular equation from my mentor sri an raman garu the cost plus cost plus profit is equal to price that is the conventional equation that we are all familiar with with reference to the entrepreneur and annadatta the provider of the food is also an entrepreneur because of simple reason there is a hr manager in him there is a finance manager in him there is a marketing manager in him there is a production manager in him so he is an entrepreneur so that he also needs to price his product based on the cost incurred plus the profit that he actually aims at or orients at for now the question is is the agriculture profitable i mean partly my discussion would be from the indian perspective because it is always a human cry in india farmers are not very happy because they are not they are been deprived of the cost that they are incurring their revenues are not sufficient enough to meet their cost of cultivation there could be explicit cost there could be implicit cost as just now madam jeevika madam has actually highlighted for so but forget about the cultivation cost and the profit margin there on what about the social needs of a farmer he has to celebrate his daughter's marriage he has to give education to his son he has to get along with so many social functions where from he gets the money if the price that he earned just request to the cost in spite of governments providing lot of subsidies lot of infrastructural facilities etc etc if the revenues fail to meet the cost of cultivation where is the question of surplus for the farmer to go for the social needs these are all the things that actually demotivate the farmer so that in fact my father knows cultivation very well i know bit of cultivation my son doesn't know cultivation at all that is the kind of a scenario that we are in so therefore my worry is that you know farmer is a precious species we should save god him then friends let us come to the cma's role or cma's focus area whenever there is a term cost is actually coined for with reference to a product or a service 
it is just an output or a thought process of cma i hope most of you agree with me we are all you know when the even in indian uh, in in india when the institute of cost accountants of india was enacted through the act of parliament the one of the vision one of the prime focus is that we specialize in the term called cost when it say cost they never you know separated the agriculture as such so therefore in the process of deriving the cost at various stages we the cma community get trained to adopt varied principles they could be generally accepted cost accounting principles in our india in our institute of cost accountants of india have already released 24 cost accounting standards and those standards actually drive the principles on which the cost have to be collected against any product or service thus there would be some kind of a consistency in the costs that are being collected period to period year to year person to person that is the whole objective and of course they have to be paid one more interesting point let me highlight here which actually drives the objective for this particular presentation is that during pandemic agriculture is the one sector that has not got disturbed in india i mean i am sure sri lanka would bounce back shortly in fact i have a classic uh, you know case study the state where i am living 8 years back it is called telangana state if you take the productivity in the year 13 14 and the productivity in the year 2004 21 22 you would ever be surprised because of the various policy initiatives taken by the government of telangana so the farmers could plow back the kind of energies and then they have improved the productivity so much so even sri lanka would bounce back very shortly i am very optimistic about this particular aspect but the point i am trying to highlight is that agriculture is one area even covid cannot disturb the trends in agriculture therefore agriculture is the segment that we all have to really pay lot of focus lot of focus now let me bring the concerns of the farmers basically there is definitely we we use this risk and uncertainty with reference to our day to day you know business environments but they perfectly aptly you know aligned to the agriculture as well it is you know it is actually dependent upon the rain conditions rainfall productivity insects you know all the weeds so many things keep happening there and they keep actually affecting the spurious seeds and lack of fertilizers lack of quality fertilizers all these things would actually drive the agricultural industry to be a very very risky industry subject to very amount of uncertainty industry therefore we as a cms have a great role in actually checking out the mitigation plans in order to overcome these risks and these uncertainties how much does it cost to produce a quintal of paddy in india we have one india one rate 1960 rupees per quintal of paddy that is the rate given announced by the government of india as the minimum support price to the farm india sir professor marambe was explaining there are about seven agro climatic zones in sri lanka similarly in india we have 14 to 15 kind of an agro climatic zones you all know very well productivity differs cost of production differs everything differs from agri agro climatic zone to agro climatic zone even even from farmer to farmer depending upon the practices that he has got depending upon the mechanization that he was actually putting into depending upon the extent if he has got a 10 acre of land the optimality would be very excellent if you had a small holding the optimality would be not that much so these things will definitely matter a lot thus the cost of production differs from farmer to farmer village to village and from agro climatic zone to agro climatic zone then another aspect is that when the farmer produces the produce puts at the market the realization is getting influenced by three factors what is demand and supply there is an excess productivity production then obviously there would be less price there then cost of production how much it is actually costing because government as a policy maker is coming and seeing to that the nose of the farmer is always above the water level it doesn't allow the farmer to sink then of course the price trends in the market both domestic and international you know very well how the you know government actually put in some kind of a, you know plugs 
you know, in, on, on importing certain agricultural processes at times of the heavy production in the within country and vice versa. Therefore, all these issues of farming made the policy makers to evolve a balanced and integrated price structure in respect of overall needs of the economy because they need to care, take care of the producer and as well the consumer. For example, if a sugarcane farmer is to be given a high price, obviously the processing of the sugarcane is taken care to produce the sugar, you and I eat, but for the diabetic issues, we and I eat good number of sweets wherein we consume a lot of you know, sugar. If we are to pay more price to the farmer, consumer should be prepared to pay more price to the sugar, which is again not a wanted situation. So government has got a responsibility to balance these kind of issues as well. Thus the government addressing the concerns of the farmers addressing the concerns of the consumers need to fix an appropriate policy. I'll just continue an interesting uh, episode where a farmer is actually trying to break a stone kind of a fertilizer into powder. You all know urea is produced in powders and you know, I can simply sprinkle it across. You know, this particular farmer, unfortunately, when he bought the urea bag, there are a lot many gutters in that such a bag. Then he had no option except to break it into powder so that he can sprinkle around the, uh, the field. Now you look at the productivity, look at the quantitative aspects, look at the qualitative aspects. These are all unforeseen. These are all cannot be predicted. These are all cannot be even mapped to particular cost element or a cost price as well. So therefore, this kind of an extra effort is that strenuous risk, unknown, undefined risk, that the farmer is actually taking. So I just highlighted in my discussion initially, what is the objective of we being cost accountants to be concerned about the costing of agricultural activity. Then I also highlighted some of the concerns of the farmer. Then I come to the present system of costing, which in India is taken as a, a kind of a Bible kind of a scenario. Thanks to Professor M. S. Swaminathan, sir, he has you know, he's the father of green revolution in India. He's known globally. And in fact, he coined these three, these three different stages of costing. A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, and C3. I will just discuss in the next slide. What is A1, what is A2, etc. Then the policy that is announced by the Honorable Prime Minister that he wants to compensate 1.5 times of the cost of production as the price to the farmer. I'm just narrating the experience in India for the simple reason. My co-cost accountants in Sri Lanka can do good amount of a brainstorming and then take forward certain positive aspects of the entire discussion to the first, for the policy makers for an appropriate decision. Now, government wants to pay 1.5 times of the cost of production, but they want to pay at year two plus family level. What is family level here? In India, nearly 70% of the holding is small farm holding. Like myself and my wife have over two acres of the land. We cultivate. So in addition to hiring the labor, we both also go there and spend our time. Madam was mentioning about the managerial compensations, which are all something about implicit cost, explicit, implicit cost. So they are also to be loaded. Something similar to that is called the family labor. So what government said is we will pay a2 plus family labor as the base for cost of production. Then on that, we will pay 1.5 times. In such case, what happens to the investment cost? What happens to the contingency cost? These are all the concerns of the farmers only. Now, now let me just quickly, quickly talk about this particular problem that was suggested by Professor M. S. Swaminathan. Raising of nurseries, I mean, again, typically, this structure is suitable for a paddy product only. Raising of nurseries, main field preparation, manure and fertilizers, aftercare, taxes, I mean, land revenues, water sets, etc., etc. All these things are called input costs, which are known as A1 costs. My dear friends, another point I just wanted to highlight. In fact, I have seen Professor Marambe giving certain data, the factual data, depending upon the data that they have collected. In this particular presentation of mine, I am not going to discuss any absolute numbers, but I am going to discuss about the fundas 
and the principles where the CMAs can actually activate their thought process. Then A2 comes there, wherein input cost plus lease rent, if you have taken the land on lease, the lease rental can be added there. That is what is A2 cost. So what the government is saying now, A2 cost plus family labor. That is what they are saying now. But we want something beyond A2 cost. What are the, for example, I own a tractor. When SAR was showing a lot of mechanized equipment there, what happens to the capital cost for all those equipment? Who will pay for that? That is another big question to be answered. Similarly, in case uh, uh, I, I have a land, own land, where I don't pay any rentals to anybody. Uh, do I deny? I mean, will, will the government deny the rental of the, my own land? That is another implicit cost end of a situation that is again cropping up here. Then, of course, family labor has been discussed, which is anyway addressed by the government of India. Effectively, this is the A2 plus family labor is the my, my slogan. Then comes the managerial cost. We all know in the principles of economics, land labor capital organization, for every you know, for, for factor of productivity, there is some price. For land, we pay you know, uh, rent. For, for labor, we pay wages. For capital, we pay interest. For organization, I should get a profit. No? As in, we have already discussed, farmer is an entrepreneur. When as an entrepreneur, I manage my show, I run the show, I should get something, definitely. So all the costs plus some margin I should get. And that should be the cost. That should be the cost as far as the product is concerned. Then, as you know very well, just as we had a byproduct and giant product combination, we have a value of yield of straw that comes from the paddy. All that is to be removed for. Unfortunately, in mechanization, uh, this may appeal to Professor uh, Marambe sir also. Because, you know, in mechanization, what is happening, sir? We are unable to uh, recover the this straw as much as we recover under manual condition. Then, of course, finally, we come to the per rate of hectare and then the kind of a MSP is what we are actually demanding. Now, I straight away come to the important question that I wanted to present for the, uh, for the you know, think tank of Sri Lanka. The just a wishful thinking because just now, Madam was actually highlighting in her point in her in her presentation that the costing one of the constraints for the costing is the availability of the data. So that is where the problem comes. I would say this agriculture has no data culture, whether it is in India, maybe in Sri Lanka, perhaps you would have because you are relatively less in terms of population. You have got only around fourteen thousand villages or around. 2.2 crores kind of a population. Maybe it could be a little easy, or you may be having little better concentrated data. In India, nearly about 60 to 70 crore population work only on agriculture. We have close to 6 lakh villages. Getting data is becoming a, a, a Hercules task. And then even such data, whether it is authentic data or not, whether it is data is correct or not, is again a, a big question. Therefore, what I am proposing is that if you take two trainees as interns for a period of one year who are deployed to two villages, in case of Sri Lanka, you need about 7,000 batches, that's all. I mean, 14,000 youngsters can be trained by our Institute of Cost Accountants of India, ICMB Sri Lanka. And then they can be put onto the villages to collect the data. Therefore, experts like Professor Marambe, Professor Jivika, or we ourselves actually as a data providers can authenticate the data validate the data, submit to the decision makers for an appropriate policies to be given to the welfare of the public. They can be called as, say, cost collectors or cost inspectors or whatever it is. They can be taken just as an intern so that every year the interns can get tra you know, trained, they get changed also. There is no big burden on the government as such. In the process, in the process, you would have youngsters getting trained getting connected to the land and gaining confidence so that they can march ahead in their career. Farmers, his risks are covered. Anything happens is a risk. See, I was talking to you about this Korea seeding. One gentleman, one farmer in my village, two times he has put in the seeds. Third time only, two times it got wasted actually. And third time only he could successfully see the plant out of the seeds actually sprinkled across the field. Now, who is going to bear the cost 
for the first two times of the seed crops i am happy that you are importing the maize seeds which are very quality oriented seeds you are saying that there is no quality complaint as such but spurious seed is a big concern for the farmers who is going to pay for that so similarly the moment the farmer is encouraged that all his risks are been covered he has been encouraged to pursue the cultivation and he will be definitely be willing to take up the activity farming activity with courage and with pride as well and in the process of the cma sri lanka getting involved into the rural you know uh, segments the entire farming activity might come into organized government that is another interesting thing so from government perspective also it's a great thing to have good number of human resources be trying and they can even monitor the flow of the funds and, and very importantly insurance sector banking sector they have valid data to kind of in, to take any kind of a valid in case of a calamity a cyclone hits on they know what exactly is the cost incurred by the farmer that can be reimbursed farmer is happy he doesn't want to make money out of nowhere subsidies are given subsidies have to be encouraged but for the subsidies agricultural activity cannot be taken up but some monitoring has to happen for that that would be very handy if some kind of a data collection mechanism is in force or on ground from the ground level then comes question of real time data monitoring that leads to effective decision making crop colonies can be encouraged for you were tell you were talking about the you know rain fed areas and other upland areas and all so they can have a proper cropping pattern and then see to that water consumption and the pesticides consumption can be also minimized once they get minimized the farmer or the villages can even be you know rewarded for you all know there is a net zero target that is given to all the countries across the globe so these are all the other perspectives which we can effectively do in case there is some kind of a actual data collection mechanism by a person who is actually interfacing with the farmer this will actually help now friends i am coming to more and more concentrated role for the uh, for the cma profession and in the process of you know putting this data collection mechanism in place i am trying to ensure a question is the farmer happy yes i am saying that dear my dear farmer you have incurred 100 rupees i am paying 50 rupees as margin for you then he is happy number 2 i am going to sustain the capacity very very important if all of the farmers give up the farming activity what will happen so capacity sustain thing is one of the things that is going to happen here then the utility of the government funds utility of the government funds can also can be ensured is there anything sir hello hello Yeah, yeah, we can hear. We can hear. Yeah, yeah, fine. So my my point is that uh, uh, utility of uh, the utility of the government can be effectively monitored. And whatever support, whatever subsidy, whatever incentive that the government gives, farmer is happy. Then farmer lives with an assured life. Some calamity happens, he knows very well. He has incurred hundred rupees. Insurance company is going to pay for him. that gives a lot of comfort for him no nowadays in the kind of a, when the pandemic hit us whoever has got a insurance policy they were all quite comfortable and then the capacity building is something that is also getting informed getting getting very much helpful for the nation in turn all this can be effectively be trained monitored measured by the friend there another interesting aspect where the cma profession can actually play a play a big role nowadays mechanization is happening when mechanization is you have got you know i have i have shown two pictures here one is the paddy you know paddy harvesting and then thrashing kind of a mission and the other side is tractor mowed is all uh, uh, kind of an equipment if a farmer has to buy it is cost going to cost him a lot of money even if he holds nearly 20 acres of a land number one number two if somebody wants to you know handle that kind of a harvesting and thrashing mission that that driver has to be paid nearly 45 to 50000 rupees salary per month can a farmer afford that and after doing all these things these equipment are actually utilized 
hardly for you know one day or two days in order to cater to his fields so therefore government should come forward make cluster wise they should buy these capital equipment provide for every cluster couple of equipment therefore the productivity could actually improve sir professor was also mentioning about timely availability of the labor is very important sometimes the labor is not available if i if i sprinkle the spray a pesticide one day late then the damage is over so if i use the tractor molded sprayer it can actually spray the medicine spray the fertilizer in a span of one day nearly 80 to 100 acres so you can cover it so therefore government should have policy of having these kind of an equipment for every cluster thus the government Uh, the government funds would actually be optimally be utilized for and the at the same time at the same time some kind of a thought process would emerge whether to use machine or to use manpower when that kind of a balancing thought process also would emerge from the thought process of this ema because you know what is the hourly rate you know what is the hourly calculation how many hours each farm is going to consume accordingly the cost gets loaded cost gets distributed for all the fields for all the crop effectively now going forward you can see another mission this is called blade come plow you got a blade come plow i know one tractor is doing both the activities together now with all this mechanization if the cma thought process is actually you know clubbed with if cma shake cma hands he joins his hands with that of a farmer with this kind of a mechanization aspects as such cluster specific capex requirement a cma can effectively you know measure and then submit to the policy makers and whatever is the notional cost composition government need not trump in its pocket if you are exporting some x product at the time of exporting whatever is the notional cost composition of their investment they can load onto the cost of production incurred by the farmer then charge the export price that is the beauty of the entire mechanism then the productivity aspect is by addressing the time and motion studies we are all familiar with our time and motion studies productivity aspects are can be analyzed for whether it is good to use mechanized force or to use only man power when the for the purpose of getting an activity so then man power versus machine power when it is that they are in force the man power need not think that they are idle they can be shifted to lot of value added or of the field activities this is another important aspect if you shift to the off the field activity as madam was talking about the after farm gate to the consumer kind of an activity this labor who are all generally expected to be idle because of the mechanization of the farming they can go into the value added activities they can have small kinds of a rice mills some kind of some small kinds of a you know uh, you know making the product more easily marketable something like that actually it can be done now what i wanted to finally talk about is that now having addressed the objective and the concerns and the role or the connectivity for the cma in the entire agri based agri based cost management these are the some of the tasks you can straight away take optimizing the transportation cost some of the very very few examples that we are trying to actually uh, uh, implement in some of Uh, you know practical case studies we can one of the cost accountant who is also farm he was advocating this view sir if there is only a small road into my field only couple of people can go and bring the produce to the road instead an approachable road goes there a bulk material bulk handling equipment bulk handling vehicle can come up to my field i can avoid the packing material directly dump the entire produce into the container container would go take the material to the rice mill whereby the value addition value engineering study can take place this one of the thought process was initiated by one cost accountant come farmer in one place called kanuku in andhra pradesh there government can come forward to provide you know this kind of a road kind of a facilities wherein they can actually change the total gamut of packing material when i say packing material we all know there is is the is the primary packing or a secondary packing this kind of a confusion would come but ideally in agriculture because the farmer is not going to export directly everything is a primary packing it forms part of the cost of production directly 
Then another important aspect is, as I already highlighted, balancing between manpower involvement and mechanization. Then another interest, interesting study that has cropped up is that when government is actually very serious about the net zero target, most of the corporates are taking up this net zero target. There could be some situation where bullet cards can be used. There could be some situation where tractors can be used. So wherever the bullet cart is being used, if some kind of a carbon credit, because you know, to the extent he is preventing the emissions, carbon emissions, he can be given some kind of a credits. These kind of a conceptual thought processes can be actually embedded into the system by a CMA if he actually goes to the field, makes some on-field studies. Another interesting aspect is abnormal wastage. We are very much fascinated to actually set aside a part of a material cost as abnormal cost because, you know, we talk of yield ratios, input-output ratios, etc., etc. I have told you about the Fourier seed example. Similarly, for example, a farmer was going for drilling for a bore well. Couple of times he drilled the bore well. Third time only he is successful in actually in drilling a bore well. But what happens to the money he has spent for the first to do bore well? If you say abnormal, where will you go? Somebody has to pay him, no? So we should evolve a policy. We had a war button removal, there is one cost accounting standard. So we should have a, a policy of any abnormal wastage also to be taken into capital expenditure route and then a portion of the sum and come and sit as a part of the cost of production. These thought processes can be effectively, authoritatively be done by only one community that is the CMA community. This is the point I am trying to make. Similarly, in all conventional fields, buns are to be strengthened every now and then. Every farmer used to do that. What is that kind of a cost? Would you provide for that as a part of the cost of production or a cost of cultivation for that season? It is a capital cost. It will only improve the productivity, enhances the productivity. You should have a clear policy, any kind of a bund strengthening cost, where you would pick up. Now, I am able to throw you, I am able to place in front of you so many kinds of a cost element which are very peculiar in nature when you accept the, when you refer to the generally accepted cost accounting principles in the context of the agriculture industry. Therefore, there is a need for development of an applied cost accounting standard, converging all the thought processes and evolve one excellent cost accounting standard exclusively for agriculture and then see to that it is implemented across the boards, all the, across the, all the villages, across all the agroclimatic zones so that you get wonderful value addition as a CMA. Actually, CMA is supposed to add value in terms of in thought process. That's what can happen here. Then, friends, uh, virtually a last slide. What is that I wish? You no, know, I frankly speaking, I know I, I don't know much about our my, my brothers or uh, sisters sitting in Sri Lanka from my CMA fraternity. And I know a little bit of Sri Lanka and its uh, history. Uh, what I wanted to suggest is that our CMA Sri Lanka can think of having an MOU with varied organizations, varied universities. For just now, uh, Sar was uh, the prof our president was uh, talking about a kind of a college, university, and professional institute, you know, synchronization. So that can happen. And one submission from my side is that leave alone the efforts done by universities or the policy makers. We ourselves, we CMAs, can go directly to the field, can set aside a wing. In fact, our Institute of Cost Accountants of India has already started, they established a task force in uh, uh, in our uh, central council level and they are trying to do some kind of a studies and doing some kind of research in this particular area so we can actually evolve somebody the uh, professor marambe is saying or professor jivika is saying this is the cost of production why can't we also develop one cost of production say this is the cost of production if there is any amount of a disparity in the with reference to concept with reference to funda it can be sit you can actually rationalize the whole you know, thought process for the welfare of the farmer, finally. Another interesting aspect, this is a very, very powerful point as far as CMA community is concerned. See, Jalamolam idam jagat. Gone are those days when Dhanamolam idam jagat. Now we have a dams, we have irrigation facilities. I mean, I don't know the number of dams that are actually situated in uh, Sri Lanka, but in Telangana state, 
prior to formation of telangana and after formation of telangana there is a lot of difference with reference to the dams that are constructed or the projects that were constructed so as to provide water to the farmer but is it it, it is happening at some cost our speakers one of our chairman of the standards board was very 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 aptly brought into the point if any incentive any subsidy is coming to the farmer it is coming to him at some cost at what cost power is being produced power is being produced means for producing one unit of power you require 750 you require at least around 750 grams of coal you know what kind of a carbon emission it can create by burning one kind of a coal so when i say free power i am getting a lot of cost being incurred who is going to give me this cost so some kind of a awareness should be created in the thought process of the farmer saying that look my dear farmer you are getting free water you are getting free power you are getting free subsidiary uh, fertilizers all this is costing this much let every village know how much how much water they consumed how much power they consumed how much what kind of a burden what kind of a government spent has actually gone into that village then obviously the villagers themselves would actually think twice thrice and then they would try to match up their efforts their productivity thus the cost or the incurred with directly or indirectly are always recovered by the kind of a productivity my dear friends you can take up any number of a brainstorming session across the nation you can develop good number of it you know data report structures data structures data collection mechanisms all this can actually happen for the welfare of the farmer of sri lanka once farmer of sri lanka convinces yes i can do sri lanka is back on to the rails you know in terms of its prosperity then all these reports on various prodigies you can publish your case studies your cost studies you can publish there your involvement of student fraternity in the surveys with the farmers would actually get the student fraternity connected to what is happening on to the grounds then your ultimately all these things would actually converge your generally accepted cost accounting principles to that of the field study you all know very well generally costing is nothing but a common sense whoever does a business even a, a you know a simple maize cob vendor he actually takes his costing very well before he comes on to the road a coconut vendor he does his costing before coming on to the road so much so a farmer should be farmer should also do such things and we as a cost accountants having got authority in the generally accepted cost accounting principles should see to that we converge all these cost accounting principles into one applied cost accounting standard for agriculture then see to that the farmer is benefited immensely and uh, with this uh, submissions uh, i wish to salute professor ms swaminathan who has given the food security uh, for the, for the at least from indian perspective when they are we are able to export our some produce to sri lanka recently honorable prime minister has released one consignment to sri lanka as well so he is professor ms swaminathan i met him about 4 years back and when i said casting fraternity we are trying to do something from the casting activity he said only once other than the professional body called cost and management accountants who else can actually authoritatively say this is the cost that is the kind of a blessing professor ms swaminathan has given so with that with the slogan annadata sukhi bhava i wish to say uh, thank i wish to thank everybody and i wish to thank particularly my mentor en raman garu and uh, professor lakshman garu for having given this wonderful opportunity mm. to interact with you and share some of my thoughts with you now there is a barren land you are all cmas opportunity is plenty it is a open space for a cma to just walk in there prove your metal see to that you contribute for the prosperity of sri lanka and in turn the globe as well thank you thank you very much namaskar uh, thank you very much thank you very much mr rao uh, for explaining in detail the role the cma cost and management accountants can play in the calculation of cost of the agricultural sector of the agricultural products and the role the institutes such as cma sri lanka uh, cost accountants of india can play in order to groom the uh, members in uh, in order to calculate the varied cost related to the agricultural outputs now 
may have the pleasure of listening to some expert comments of our advisory council member, Mr. A. N. Brahman, who is also the past president of South Asian Federation of Accountants, past council member of the Institute of First Accountants of India. Brahman, sir, we would like to hear from you. Mike is, is muted. Mike is muted. You have to unmute. Yeah. All ah, right. Okay. Fine. fine. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor, for pointing this out. I was telling that I'm extremely happy to be a part of this uh, wonderful event where I could listen to Professor Marande and Divika of the concerns in Sri Lanka and also with uh, a passionate flow of how Zitendra Rao is thinking through these ideas of application of uh, cost and management accounting in the agricultural sector. I am not sure whether you introduced this dimension of Zitender while introducing him. Zitender is also a farmer. He is a chartered accountant, practicing as a cost and management accountant, and he is also a farmer. And that's the reason why all these ideas are coming practically out of him in a flow. So, uh, uh, Jitendra, you have to unshare your screen. So, in particular, what impressed me in, uh, the, uh, of course, the entire presentation of Jitendra was fantastic. So, in particular, what really appealed to me was very innovative. I, I think I had off to Jitendra on this point. Giving carbon credit for a farmer who is using bullock carts as a move towards net zero, that is something uh, fabulous, Jitendra. That is a wonderful point. I think uh, we should take it up very seriously because you are you may not be aware that uh, uh, Professor Lakshman Watawala's leadership in uh, Sri Lanka for the CMA profession, they have gone miles ahead in propagating sustainability and integrated reporting in Sri Lanka. So I am sure he would immediately take this up because it's also a part of improving the profitability of the farmer and also connecting with the UNDP goals of uh, doing uh, no, uh, 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 towards the net zero and how agriculture is getting connected. So this particular point is really brilliant, uh, Zitendra. Hats off to you on this uh, thought process. Now, you have done uh, exhaustively how the uh, Mr. Professor M. S. Swaminathan, who is a father of some of the modern ideas of uh, agriculture in India, you have connected it so well in the presentation. And also Professor Marande and Jevika, they spoke a lot of uh, how the uh, farm casting, uh, paddy costing is important and uh, they were lamenting on the lack of data. And you have also very adequately brought in the concepts of how the agricultural costing is being done with the formula given by MS Swaminathan. What I would like to throw it as an important uh, point or, or my contribution as a part of the expert panel is you look at the agricultural as a full-fledged ecosystem and come up with the point on how the cost accounting standards can connect to the fertilizer pricing. So fertilizer is very strongly, of course, all of us know is connected with agriculture and uh, fertilizer and fertilizer pricing is of a, a major issue in Sri Lanka as well. But only thing is they don't manufacture it. This particular practice, what we are having in, in India, I'm going to share with the participants. And, and we should debate and think how we can improve the concept in a situation where manufacturing is not done. That is the only change we have to think of. I will now explain this concept of how cost accounting principles get connected uh, with Agri with fertilizers in the agricultural uh, uh, costing for the agricultural sector. So now, friends, uh, the Indian farmers consume a huge amount of fertilizer, like you know, NPK and things like that, and uh, of various mixes. And it comes from lots and lots of fertilizer companies spread throughout the country. There are lots of fertilizers in Andhra Pradesh or Telangana from where Zitendra is coming. There is a very big fertilizer company in Chennai where I am operating from. There are fertilizer companies in western part and eastern part and northern part, etc., etc. Now, 
fertilizer pricing is a major political uh, 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 politically tainted topic also because if uh, fertilizer prices rise the whole thing becomes unprofitable to the farmers and the farmers lobby so strong in india that anything concerning them uh, it uh, resonates as a key political issue against the government policies so as a result for a right from the beginning for a very long time fertilizer pricing has been under strict government control so for the sake of simplicity of your understanding i am going to take an example of let us say one particular key fertilizer the cost of production for example is say 100 rupees the company incurs 100 rupees to produce one bag of one particular fertilizer or one kilogram whatever way you want let us say one bag of a fertilizer the company incurs cost of 100 rupees now the fertilizer pricing ecosystem consisting of the farmers the political lobbies and others they have lot of pressure exerted on the government and they would not allow the fertilizer price to go beyond a certain point and that has to be subsidized so this particular fertilizer which is costing 100 rupees cannot be priced as 100 plus 10% margin 110 rupees to farmers not possible because of this lobbying system and uh, ecosystem in the fertilizer industry so what would the government any government do irrespective of the party to which it belongs in india fertilizer prices are subsidized so they would give a they would they would tell the companies the price is under control so there is a regulatory body from the ministry of fertilizer which says you this particular fertilizer you have to compulsorily give it to the farmer at rupees 50 only so that means 50% subsidy the farmer gets it as gets it at rupees 50 he gets a subsidy of rupees 50 he is happy with the rupees 50 fertilizer pricing because his agricultural profitability per hectare or per acre would go up but what about the fertilizer company the fertilizer company has to manufacture at 100 rupees and sell it at 50 it is not a sustainable practice it will go fat it will be torn asunder financially in maybe uh, one or two financial years so what the government of india is doing the subsidy is given directly to the fertilizer companies that means what in our example 100 rupees minus 50 rupees that 50 rupees is given to the fertilizer companies there is a, a big competition process now how does this happen the fertilizer company will have to produce a very very traceable auditable costing statement that it has really costed them 100 rupees including let us say equalized freight for distributing the fertilizer in various parts of the country so they will have to prove to the government that they have incurred rupees 100 as a cost that proving of 100 rupees cost cannot be based on any costing practice they have they would do it based on compile the cost based on cost accounting standards and what cost accounting standards they would use they would use fertilizer companies here are, are referred to as they fertilizer companies are expected to use the cost accounting standards issued by the institute of cost accountants of india the 21 standards which jitendra rao was referring to based on the cost accounting standards these fertilizer companies produce a cost statement of how much it was costing let us say 100 rupees someone may say 99 someone may say 95 someone may say 103 but it should all be closer to the mean value of 100 if someone produces a cost statement showing 150 rupees is my cost of production then there will be a serious audit into that why is it 150 is it not as per a cost accounting standard what is there something wrong in that so that sort of cost investigation from the government department ministry of fertilizers would happen and finally they would produce an average subsidy for the fertilizer companies which will be given based on what is the farmer sale token or Uh, some proof of document for that company having sold so many bags to the farmers at a subsidized price so that means what the fertilizer company gets 50% of its price as subsidy from the government of india and 50% of the bag is given by the farmer and this entire 50 plus 50 100% is based on a cost accounting statement prepared under the platform of cost accounting standards this is how the cost accounting standards become relevant for societal costing 
why it is societal costing here the information which is based on the cost accounting standards is used by the government of india in the public interest for taking a public decision to support the farming community so it is since the decision is taken for supporting the society at large the basic information coming from a cost accounting standard since it is applied in the interest of the society we are calling it as a societal costing this is one simple example where an important ingredient like fertilizer is connected with this ecosystem of agriculture and helps improve the costing in the agricultural practices this is one dimension which can be thought of and the only thing is this would need modification in a situation where fertilizer is not manufactured but it is completely imported like in a situation like in sri lanka fertilizer is not manufactured within the country but it is imported of course the different things are there is it natural manure or is it artificial synthetic and is it uh, of good quality they are all other issues but the costing can support the decision like this now i will connect this with lastly with one more point which ruchira in was uh, making this point in the last webinar on the cost accounting standards framework is a societal costing that means applicable only to the government controlled products it is no the answer is no it is not like that any industry would require a rigor of maintaining cost accounting information any industry needs a basic discipline of maintaining cost records whether it is in a controlled economy or whether they export in a totally a market free economy or they supply to the government for societal pricing in all these cases we need a basic discipline in companies and that basic discipline is understand the distinction between what is financial accounting and what is cost accounting and maintain basic records like consumption what is a production specific consumption or if it is a service sector for this particular service what technology is used what manpower is used basically the input output connection through the cost records constitute the fundamental discipline out of that fundamental discipline if the decision is taken for public purpose it becomes a societal costing in societal costing is common for managerial costing as well as the government application so that doesn't mean that people should who are going through the framework issued by the cm sri lanka should not misunderstand that societal costing is meant only for the government controlled companies it is not so the rigor and discipline which is required for the maintaining the cost records that part of any costing system is applicable to any business enterprise or any economic activity this particular conceptual clarity we need to keep on communicating to the audience at large in sri lanka so with this very few comments i thank professor ruchira and others for having given me an opportunity to participate in this webinar thank you professor thank you ruchira thank you sir thank you mr raman for that uh, wonderful explanation about the societal costing and how cost records can be used in this whole structure to calculate the subsidies by a government now we are coming to the question session so in this session actually all speakers will be joined by professor watabala mr mahendra I, i think i don't think he is here now so uh, speakers will be joined by professor watabala mr raman and also by mr mariyodi alvis who is the managing director of mass tropical foods so to start the question and answer session i would like to start with mr mario since he is representing the private sector here mr mario in your view why the calculation of cost of agricultural products is important in the private sector can you give us a private sector perspective well uh, one one of the things is uh, rushira i must thank you for the question and uh, something that i must say is uh, we uh, at this moment of time sri lanka is going through uh, some very difficult times and uh, had we a culture of uh, accounting and costing things uh, i believe we wouldn't have been in this situation we wouldn't have got ourselves into this situation so let me take uh, uh, it a little further my explanation 
we st still talk about uh, in people being inclusive and people being exclusive, excluded from the uh, general economy of the country. Now, why does that happen? Because we do not give any value to the 1.7 million small farm uh, holdings that are there in this country. If there was some value and people realize, you see, the amount that they are paying at the end of the retail chain, the food chain, uh, that has been costed and they know what the farmer has to go through to actually produce that and the actual cost, there will be much more respect uh, for the job that they are doing. So uh, one thing is, I think overall uh, for this country, we need to have a proper data collection system. This is the era of information. Every single person must be recorded. And in the food chain, you see, when you say agriculture, the important thing is the food chain. There are non-food items also like rubber and things. But in the food chain, the most important thing is traceability. And if you had that information, costing becomes a very important part of that traceability. Because you see, people avoid uh, being traced, especially in the agriculture. There is this uh, general belief of uh, tax avoidance. They feel uh, if they know these numbers, we will have to pay tax and uh, you know various issues. So it's very, very important that these costing and things come in. But prior to that, uh, uh, I think all uh, most of the uh, speakers who presented excellent uh, presentations, they came up with the fact that it's a very difficult uh, thing to cost agriculture because there are so many varied scenarios. But if we had a registration system, you see, each of our farmers today have smartphones and, uh, you know, each of them had uh, things uh, connected from the farm hole right up to the supermarket counter. We could put the cost in and we could, as a country, uh, we can put inputs uh, or we could advise people or help people to get out of this situation. And another thing is, of course, I am totally against the uh, uh, subsidies given at production level in agriculture because I think it distorts the whole system because the consumers who need the subsidy or don't need the subsidy both both consume the same product which is coming. So I, I feel that the, the if we are having a free market and we say it is so, farmers should be allowed to uh, you know produce at whatever cost and the consumers who can't afford should be then help to purchase that rather than uh, you know a general subsidy at the uh, production point and for this again uh, you know these costings and things are very important and the traceability of your foodstuffs thank you thank you mr Varyu. now mr Raman, now he was explaining that uh, he was against your idea that it should that subsidy should be given at the production level now also he was telling uh, that it is very important to get the correct cost structure, correct cost structure and correct cost details when it comes to the agriculture cost calculations. Here, I'm sure you will agree, we have we can we can uh, calculate the correct cost of producing agricultural products based on the cost accounting standards. And CMA Sri Lanka, with the help of all the advisors such as you, have been in the process of developing the cost accounting guidelines. We have issued guidelines, I'm sure. The based on the guidelines and based on the accounting standards that we are going to issue in the future, this process will be helped up. Any any views on this, Mr. Raman? No, uh, actually, there is no contradiction in the suggestion what uh, he, uh, he was giving and uh, what I was telling on the... I was talking about fertilizer manufacturing. He is talking about the, the farm output uh, consumption. Now, what I am speaking is when the fertilizer companies sell to farmers, that fertilizer, which is forming a part of the ecosystem of the agricultural uh, agricultural ecosystem, when the fertilizer is sold to a consumer like farmer, at that point only subsidy is given. He is very right. It is not a subsidy on manufacture. What I explained was subsidy of a sale only. But the only thing is it comes in the value chain one step before the farming activity, which comes in the production of agriculture and sale of agricultural fertilizers forms a part of the value chain of the agricultural ecosystem. 
so in that value chain this subsidy what i spoke of is not production related it is only at a sell point only thing is here the farmer is a consumer and not the general public general public eats the produce of the farmer farmer is a consumer of the fertilizer that is a value chain link as he rightly said this subsidy which is released by the government is on the sale of fertilizers to the farmer not on the manufacture of the fertilizers is quite right and there is no contradiction with what i said thank you okay mr professor jb can i would like to question you now when we do a complete cost calculation in order to get the value added cost when it comes to transportation storage packing distribution etc can we use the cost estimates or uh, the cost calculations of the previous studies is there a database available from which we can get the cost yeah, actually database are available uh, the cost of production up until uh, you reach the farm level and okay. uh, they are after what we have are some anecdotal evidences so the the value chains uh, differ from uh, differ from uh, crop to crop uh, you know uh, animal sector to animal sector so it's very difficult to generalize uh, from these uh, uh, <coughs> previous studies uh, and come up with the cost structure Uh, uh for the uh, farm sector and beyond so you you really need to do some serious studies uh, so i'm i'm with you uh, and uh, i'm very happy that uh, you all are interested in uh, getting into this business uh, when economists uh, do that of course uh, we go uh, two steps uh, away from uh, the market prices that you generally use for your analysis uh, as accountants we like to see uh, the economic uh, Uh, values uh, like uh, when we take uh, fertilizer price we would like to take uh, the world market uh, price of fertilizer adjusted for all the transportation cost so that will uh, show us the true cost of production and uh, environmental economists uh, go one step beyond and uh, they add the environmental pollution associated with the uh, uh, chemical usage as well so this can be large this can be small it, it all depends on uh, uh, the, the agricultural systems you are in and also uh, uh, you have to uh, rely on scientific evidences uh, in finding out uh, environmental costs uh, i reply to that chat uh, saying that uh, ideally you should accommodate all these costs uh, and show uh, whether it is a profitable venture or not like when you simply use market prices it is possible that uh, you will see that uh, the system is profitable but uh, mm -hmm. if you uh, discount uh, for uh, subsidies and environmental costs uh, you will see that uh, it is not uh, as profitable as uh, you thought so mm -hmm. it's important to do uh, uh, this analysis uh, you know using some reliable data and update them as and uh, when uh, circumstances change then only we can uh, propose good policies like uh, 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 right now uh, the issue is that we really do not have a good uh, database i'm happy that uh, you will take the first uh, step in costing agriculture sector thank you no sir maram now when it comes to cost calculation uh, richira sorry for a minute yes, i will okay, take sir. leave because at 5:15 i have some activity lined up so i will take leave of you and uh, professor and other speakers okay, okay. thank you very much for joining sir Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pro Pro Sir Maram, this question is to you. Now, what deficiencies are there when it comes to cost calculations in the agricultural sector, and how we can overcome such deficiencies in order to provide reliable information for policymakers? Yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. In general, Sri Lanka is data deficient. I think. I mean, that that's what we have seen. But more importantly, even the available data are scattered among institutions and. we have failed miserably to bring those data into a one platform and that's what has been the major problem everybody would like to share but everyone thinks others should share data with me not me who is going to share my data set with others now this type of concept has been there unfortunately in practice in the, in the long run so this this line of thinking will have to change uh, 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 richard we without that it will be very difficult for us to move forward but organizations like you coming forward requesting this information for a purpose is not just not just data sharing but you are requesting it for a purpose that will definitely be beneficial uh, if you come up analyze interpret 
such information so that it can be provided to policymakers to get to take more prudent decisions. Thank you. Yeah. So one more question. Now, what institutions, what institutions are there from us for us to get reliable cost information in the yes, agricultural so, value chain? I mean, as as Professor Vireva also said and included in my presentation, also Department of Agriculture, who is I mean, which is mandated is the mandated agency for good for production agriculture in Sri Lanka in crop science in crop production. They have data related to production aspects. The two examples that I showed you are coming from them. Then if you take Department of Animal Production and Health, they have their uh, relative set of information with them based on animal production. So you likewise, you go to fisheries and so on. If you want to get market information, the Hector Kobeka to Agrarian Research and Training Institute has information over there. Now, I mean, whether the data are reliable or not, the important part is to get them in one platform. Then and only then we can move forward. So those are the institutions, some of the institutions that I met. Of course, you cannot forget Department of Census and Statistics. We, we, we always receive the processed information from them rather than data. So it, it's, it's a dialogue that you also can open up, actually, with among uh, all these institutions that will help this worthy cause in the future. Thank you. Ruchira, if I can ask a question. You know, now one, one of the things that we are recommending is to maintain cost records. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our both professors and uh, Mr. Mario, uh, and of course, if uh, Mr. Gitendra is also there, uh, what is the, uh, do you think that that is a, a practical, will it be a practical way for farmers uh, to maintain uh, records of uh, costing? Um, let me come, come in first, uh, Professor Watwala. Thank you very much. An important aspect, but in terms of practical terms, yeah, so far it has been a difficult scenario because I know even different projects tried it out. But of course, during the project period with some incentives are being given, so the farmers are pushed toward the same. We are recording took place, but then when the project leaves, as in the other cases as well, you don't see that practice going on. But the Department of Agriculture have their way of doing it by having contract growers, contract farmers, having certain level of surveys being done periodically to get this information. That's one way of handling where an institution gets involved with a sample of uh, uh, people in the, at the ground level to collect that information. Now take uh, even the Department of Census and Statistics. They, they have their household service and so on. Professor Viriva will be explaining it much better than me, I'm sure. But then still, it's rather than the farmers doing it on their own, but of course, we, I know there are a few guys who are doing it because they do understand the benefit of it because they are more, more entrepreneurial in that case. So this some, sometimes the capacity building may work up to a certain level. But I know for the time being, uh, Professor, uh, whatever people consider it as a headache. It's an additional work and for them. And that's that's a line of thinking which you have to change. Thank you. Mr. Mario, you have any yes. comments on that? Uh, yes, so I'm. Uh, we are a country who actually, even if, if we don't have the data or if we don't have the accurate data, and even if we have it, we don't uh, tend to use it. Uh, I'll give you a, a good example. Currently, we have these long queues in front of petrol sheds. Now, every single vehicle in this country is registered with the uh, register of uh, motor traffic. So uh, the government knows how much of diesel and petrol is coming into the country. And they know the vehicles. All they have to do is to have a simple data system where they send a uh, text to the person and say, go and pick up your 10 liters of uh, fuel, or go and pick up your two liters of fuel to, for, for your thing without creating this. Thing. So this is, we need a whole culture of you know, data, first thing is people must accept that being in the data system makes you an inclusive citizen of the country. That's number one. And then the second thing is that the uh, uh, country itself makes use of the data that is available for the benefit of the people. So that creates an incentive for this to be done properly. And within that, the costing systems and things will build up over the long run and it will, you know, show... Uh, some profits and loss. Uh, and the other thing is also the uh, fact that uh, the risk in agriculture. You see, if you uh, now people are heading for this crisis and saying there's not going to be food and rice or something. 
there are people who have just put money into banks and they are getting you know 18 20 percent uh, or even less uh, interest now if you go and ask any of those guys can you put uh, 200000 rupees to a farmer who has 2 hectares of land uh, to cultivate and you can have your years uh, uh, rice Plus, the farmer will have a year's rice, his seed paddy for the next season, and another family, three families can be fed for this thing. Uh, why don't you invest this money? It's uh, profitable for you. And uh, they won't. Because the data is not available. And there is no accounting system. But if it was there and the risk was, you know, calculate, you can calculate that risk, it's yeah, very visible. Then I'm sure all these people who have, uh, you know, fixed deposits in various places and sometimes even losing them would uh, consider at this moment of time actually to drive the agriculture sector because there is a huge shortage of uh, uh, capital. So I think it's a very important thing that you all are trying to do. But prior to that, we need to definitely see that this data is collected and the country itself. You see, we, we, we tend to say, uh, uh, see Singapore, but Singapore is a small uh, you know, city state. We are a country which has so much of resources and everything. So without having that data and having a culture of uh, knowing what, uh, you know, what results we can get and going, we are not going to get anywhere. And this is an ideal opportunity because we have gone to ground zero. Yes. yes and yes. if we do this, we can build it up. One other question uh, I want to pose is on the yield, you know, because now that is a very, very important uh, uh, concept for the working out the costs. Now, one of the things is this organic fertilizer that came in. As a result, the yields went down. Now, how, how do you think that uh, now this will affect now? Supposing if we are going for, say, organic fertilizer, then the uh, cost is uh, going up. So, whether the farmers would be able to uh, uh, maybe cover all their costs with uh, this sort of uh, arrangement? Not. Uh, uh, that, uh, that is what uh, we can see right now. Most of the farmers uh, abandoned uh, uh, cultivation of their lands. Uh, and uh, we, we, we can see that uh, they did this cost calculation and realized that uh, uh, they would uh, not earn sufficient uh, profits uh, with, this, uh, uh, with, uh, with the existing uh, prices. Uh, of fertilizers, like of course, uh, several substitutes uh, came in. Nano fertilizers came in, uh, different types of uh, organic fertilizers came in. But uh, uh, when you when you look at uh, the cost for such uh, items, the farmers found that uh, it is not worth uh, investing uh, in uh, such uh, uh, such uh, substitutes. So that 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 was obvious. And uh, even now, the 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 chemical fertilizers are way too uh, uh, costly uh, compared to uh, what we experienced earlier. So I don't think that uh, farmers would be willing to purchase uh, fertilizers uh, if we uh, distribute them uh, at uh, market prices without a subsidy. Mr. Jitendra, what is the, uh, maybe uh, in India, how does it work? Uh, we were talking about the subsidies now. And also these organic uh, organic fertilizer. Are you you want to comment or? Yeah. So uh, I I I totally agree with uh, uh, Professor Jivika, but I think uh, the major problem there is the mindset. We got uh, our fertilizer and everything free. Now it is not available, so we can't cultivate. Is the government going to give this to us or not? Uh, if the farmer was paying for their fertilizer and buying it from the first instance, you know, being you implemented by NABARD India, but it is not that successful in terms of data collection, but it is successful in giving some collective bargaining power to the farmer, thereby strengthening the farmers. So, in your case, you can type for data collection. Subsidies, hello, and uh, regarding subsidies. Yes, I mean, uh, though uh, the, it's a political issue, naturally, subsidies are being given, but uh, there, is a, there is a proper accountability. The, the farmer is getting some money directly into his account. They are very clear, categorically ex exempted 
income tax pays and uh, government employees from the list and technology is playing a very big role in actually filtering and seeing through the subsidies goes only to the deserving persons that is another thing also that is happening sir thank you uh, sorry mari you can continue i think you yeah uh, so uh, what, what i'm saying is if there was a counting system uh, there would have been a difference between the two uh, types of agriculture uh, pro, uh, you know uh, that is the organic and the non organic system so first time foremost that's what i think affected the people most you know suddenly from that because if we were in the free market situation where the farmer was paying for their fertilizer and going they would have only said ah the cost has gone up uh, where do i find my uh, finance to bridge the gap that's how we all think and if the farmer was uh, prepared for that and prime for that that's how they would have think but when there is something given to somebody free right along the time and then suddenly taken back there ah we can't cultivate what we were getting we are not getting anymore so that was the danger but if you look at uh, i i notice something fantastic that in the north when i ask my people uh, outreach people how are you managing in the north i found that they are using a mix of uh, you know compost and various things together with uh some of the chemical fertilizer the only you know the terrible danger there is that they are smuggling in uh, uh chemicals and fertilizer and various things and when we export products we are getting traceability you know traces of certain uh, components and metals and things that are not there in the approved uh, stuff that is used in the country so uh, they went through a war and they didn't have all those subsidies during the 30 years and they learned how to handle such situations in a better manner and they they work on a much more calculated because uh, and and the question we should ask ourselves is that with free education uh, uh, why do we not uh, trust our farmers to calculate and do a good job you see why are we giving people free education if we are not asking them to use it the 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 thing is we need to have everybody needs to fall in line with this discipline system of accounting and uh, seeing things through then i think uh, definitely we can raise our heads we you know it's a nice compact small economy but if we all get into that system and move it uh, you know uh, we can move Uh, ahead with, uh, but even from the situation we are in. What do you do, sir? Professor Watavela. Yes. Professor Watavela, can I make? I mean, can I come in? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, fine. Yeah, on the on the same line, what Mr. Mario and Elvis was speaking on, uh, it's true what he said. Quite correct in the northern province, what's happening because they went through a bad patch and they adopted the system to have a mixed use of synthetic fertilizer and organic fertilizer, which. the department of agriculture and every one of us were promoting for ages right now the recommendation is as such to make sure both are uh, combined when it come to since the organic fertilizer issue came up and do remember even now government has committed to provide organic fertilizer free of charge for paddy cultivation that's the government policy even right now even at this particular moment that we speak of everything going free of charge is not going to serve the purpose i mean i'm that that, that it's, it's a real waste on the other hand but the issue came with organic fertilizer is that whether it's been sold or given free of charge it cannot provide the required nutrients for the crops to grow and people found it by experience as well that's why even the people the farmers in the northern province go for a mix I mean, they go for a mix but as uh, mr mario said i mean all those things that we have even banned several years ago for ages you now find the traces of, of of those chemicals in the products that they grow and when when you start exporting only you will start finding this issue so these problems are there the only only way out is that accounting system is good accounting system is not only in financing accounting system of for example even for nutrients Uh, there should be a fully a full account, a fully accounting systems to make sure the farmers can make their decision. They are very well experienced. I mean that's why uh, why farmers came to the field when the Department of Agriculture wanted to cultivate about eight hundred fifty thousand hectares of paddy in last maha. They were able to people were able to cultivate more than eight hundred thousand, and that's a significant achievement. 
but they were trying to use whatever the organic fertilizers that were supplied by the government, they didn't work. So it's by experience only all these issues started coming up. People came to roads, people in tarred roads or carpeted roads, not in their paddy fields. It's mainly because of the repercussions that they started feeling from square one. So the accounting is important, all in all. The accounting should come in, in, in many spheres. That's the important part if you have to get this agriculture thing going in the future. Thank you. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, Professor, since we are running out of time, I would like to ask one final question from all the panelists. Do you think the costing will help the agricultural sector to come out of the decline? 100%, sir. 100%. 100% it will actually uh, help all policy makers, all users, all these stakeholders in appropriate decision making, sir. Thank you. Um, Mario? Sorry. Yeah, uh, well, as soon as you bring accounting and things like that and create a value at the field, one of the most important thing is we will be able to also support our educated youth to stay back on the field. Just look at the policy that the government has, you know, offered policy. We are telling our young people, no, no, you don't wait here, we'll give you a passport free, we'll give you five lakhs, go abroad and send the dollars. How is this country going to run? You see? We have to find ways and means of keeping our people back because we need the brain, we need the brawn. You see, so that's why I, I think that, you know, having things like accounting and all that and making farming a proper business from agriculture to agribusiness, the, the, the transformation will help us to keep our young people back in the field, make agriculture more profitable, uh, spend on technology. You see, I, I always ask the question, if my son, who is processing agricultural produce, can go in the evening and have a chat with his friends and, you know, discuss the country and its politics, and the farmer's son, who is producing that uh, amount, can't, he's so, so tired that he doesn't have the technology to help him and he can't afford to do that. Then why should the young people of this country go and work on the field? So that uh, environment has to be created. And the only way we can do is to create that value and accounting will be one as, as Professor Marambe said, accounting for climate, accounting for nutrients, accounting for the social impact, everything. We have educated youth, make use of them and help them to understand what they're doing is more important than just the figures on your balance sheet, but uh, everything else. I'm sure you know about uh, these same people are at golf is shouting their thing, what is the profit they are making there? These are committed young citizens of this country. Why can't we move them to understand and the, you know, by using these tools and technology, we can get them back and get them to, you know, contribute uh, more than just sitting at a junction with a three wheeler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Professor Maharabe. Uh, yeah, while agreeing to what Mr. Mario said, my simple answer is yes. But of course, accounting accounting is not just only cost accounting of, of what we spoke of right now. Correct. It's an overall thing. It, it will take time, but gradually we have to move forward towards that end. Thank you. Kivika, I would like to get your views also. Um, yes, uh, I also agree that uh, accounting is uh, important and costing should be done. But I think... Uh, you should do costing uh, for the enterprises for which uh, you see uh, missing uh, missing data. Like I don't think that uh, you have to reinvent the wheel. As I uh, and Professor uh, Marambe said, uh, like we have enough and more uh, uh, costing uh, information uh, related to uh, primary production. So what is missing is uh, the costs for the remaining activities in the value chain. So I, I think uh, one has to focus on that. Uh, you have to identify the gap and then fill that gap. So that is one thing, but uh, costing will not uh, uh, help uh, to understand uh, the big picture and uh, to uh, propose uh, solutions uh, to the problems that uh, we are having uh, at large. I think uh, you need to understand that our resources are limited, then you will have to uh, allocate these resources uh, in the enterprises which uh, will generate uh, higher returns. So 
So fertilizer subsidy, uh, of course, is a controversial uh, topic. And I agree with uh, Mr. Alvis, like we should have uh, removed the uh, fertilizer subsidy a long time uh, ago, but uh, we continued that. And then all of a sudden, uh, we uh, completely banned the importation of uh, chemical fertilizers. We should have just removed uh, the fertilizer subsidy. Ideally, partially first, uh, but uh, even uh, a complete removal of uh, the subsidy would have been uh, better. So we should understand uh, that uh, people uh, uh, people uh, look at uh, economics, not only the cost, but also the return from an enterprise. Uh, so they look at uh, how much they can earn. So we, we uh, should... Uh, keep that in our mind and propose policies uh, uh, for uh, people to uh, uh, people to earn better uh, without harming the environment and uh, without uh, unnecessarily uh, relying on uh, government money uh, 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 to get uh, subsidies so economic in economic incentives are to be designed uh, based on costing but uh, based on some other things as well so Costing will uh, help us uh, filling uh, one uh, piece of the big puzzle that we are having. Thank you. But if I can just make a comment on that costing records. Now, you know, uh, we are saying that we are satisfied because the Ministry of Agriculture, they are all maintaining records. But the thing is, we must really, what we want to do is the person who is maybe engaged in the farming industry, they will maintain the records. Then they know what is really happening. That's uh, what we are trying to say. You know, someone can come and calculate the cost. That is not what we want. And, and that will help even if they want to go to the bank for a loan. If they have the records, everything, they will know what the cost is. What is their selling price? Now, even if they have to sell something to someone, if their cost is very much lower. Now, when they demand a, a price uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the government or maybe from the ultimate uh, uh, purchaser, then at least they will have some records now because unfortunately now this system is there everywhere. If you take the transport system, same thing. If you take the bakery man, same thing. No one is having any records, but they are all fixing prices based on some assumption that is there. So I think we need to go to the actual basis. What I'm saying is let us go actual basis and then these entrepreneurs will be able to come up. That's what I'm sure, I'm sure uh, that would be uh, something that uh, what Mr. Mario has been saying. Because to become an entrepreneur, then of course you must uh, uh, have all these things as plus also the students who study maybe commerce or whatever they study, then they will be able to apply this when they are doing the practical aspects. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary. We are half past uh, five now, 30 minutes behind the scheduled finish time. So I think we can finish the session now. Right. Uh, okay. Okay, Ujira. So anyway, let me uh, thank all uh, uh, our speakers and panelists uh, because uh, this was a new subject that we uh, have arrived. Because I am happy that we have been able to make an impact. Because I I know that uh, uh, the universities are looking more at economic aspects, but we as professional accountants are looking at the costing aspects which will be more useful for the practical people. So I think uh, we've now been able, uh, we should have a, uh, carry on this uh, discussion and maybe do some research work and others, which uh, we can combine both uh, so that uh, for the benefit of the country, because I'm sure uh, Mr. Mario is an entrepreneur. Now he, he knows how, uh, what has to be done, uh, what we need to take. So I think uh, we have uh, three three parties which are really uh, maybe able to uh, maybe uh, put into practice uh, what we have done. Because what we also want to see is uh, what is the contribution that we can make uh, to the society. Now, like Mr. Uh, what was mentioned by Mr. Raman, uh, as uh, the societal costing. Now, we have brought in that cost uh, system to say, because even if you produce something, then we should have the efficiency, the productivity, all those things will come in because otherwise, say maybe we will lose organic uh, fertilizer and if the production quantity is less, then the, farmer, the end, end uh, consumer has to pay for that. So we need to have a balance and then see what it is and also the Indian experience 
uh, that was given by Mr. Jitendra was very useful. I think uh, we need to interact because there it is very, very developed, very highly developed uh, the systems and procedures they are having. And we also need some support from the government. Now, I don't know, you all uh, might be having uh, uh, Professor Buddhi uh, with uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture. I think we need to get them also involved and see how uh, we can uh, uh, put this into being. But uh, I think it was very, very uh, useful uh, uh, webinar that we had, and I'm sure that uh, this will also help us to create the uh, uh, get together and then create this thing because SMEs now, yesterday you'd have seen in the papers that there was uh, uh, maybe a, a, a press briefing where they say that so many SMEs are there. So uh, even the farmers, uh, majority of the farmers are coming under uh, that, ca that category and they are uh, not they will be really the informal sector because there is no one going to look after them. Uh, they have to work for themselves. Uh, so we need to really uh, maybe promote this area. Uh, so let me thank uh, everyone for your valuable contribution. Uh, although we have gone uh, half an hour additional, I think it uh, really has brought value. And let's continue this. I think if we continue this, it will bring uh, value to all of us. And uh, uh, let's uh, have the universities, the uh, private sector, I think, uh, Mr. Mario is chairman of the Agri uh, Council. I think you can play a very major role then from our side, from our custom management account standards board. And of course, the, uh, we have the links with the Indian uh, parties. Mr. Raman is there, Mr. Jitain is there. So we can get all their uh, maybe support uh, to work out. Uh, and this, this is a very good start uh, for what we have done. And I'm sure that this will also forge, uh, as I said earlier, the closer relationship with the uh, University of Peradeniya and maybe uh, for your faculty where we may be able to see how this uh, cost concepts can be put in uh, in order that they will also be able to use this for the benefit of the country. So thank you very much. And I know that uh, crisis situation is there, but uh, if they make use of the professionals and uh, the experience uh, uh, business uh, and uh, entrepreneurs, uh, certainly uh, they are the people who can pull the country uh, out of this uh, Crisis. So let's keep trying and uh, let's give this message to uh, the uh, maybe uh, the political and the other uh, government setup uh, so that they will also be able to transform themselves and uh, make it a very, very, uh, maybe a very good place uh, for all our activities. And maybe we can uh, let or mention about dual phase. So give, give all, all of them uh, very, very, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, important areas that they can get into, go into jobs because people are talking, but the people who are producing are no there. So farmers are people who are really producing, you know, they are not talk, not talking, they are producing and then feeding the people of this country and food security is a very, very important uh, area. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the work that has been done by the university and uh, of course, Mr. Mario processing the agricultural items and uh, Mr. Jitendra, uh, giving the advice as a specialized cost accountant will certainly help us. So once again, let me thank everyone and I wish you all the very best and let's continue uh, our discussions uh, for the future. Thank you and all the very best. Let me thank all our participants. I know that uh, some are still remaining, but uh, I do hope that all of you all found it very useful. Thank you, Richard, for, for the good uh, moderation you have done and uh, uh, given uh, good exposure on the agricultural costing of the agricultural se sector. So, thank you and uh, all the very best to all of you. Thank you and bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Professor Marabe. Thank you, thank Professor Jamie. Thank you. 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 Uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Bye. Right. Thanks, Professor. Good day. Right. Okay. All the Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Mario. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Bye. We close up. Huh? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mario.